One of the things that I really learned from many different mentors is having recurring revenue streams. So I have, over the last few years, set up my business to have multiple recurring revenue streams. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis House. For those that don't know my story, about 12 years ago, I didn't have any money. I had no clue how to make money. I had some odd jobs here and there. I was a truck driver for a few months. I was a bouncer at a nightclub on the weekends. And I really wasn't making much money, maybe a thousand dollars a month, uh, in between one career playing arena football and then transitioning into the rest of my life. And I didn't know how to make money. I was afraid of money. I wasn't an entrepreneur. Uh, I didn't think people would give me money. I was scared to talk about it. And I'm letting you know that if that feels like any of that feels like you, that there is room for growth and improvement. And I'm going to talk about some of these habits that can support you in your life. And I want you to get out a piece of paper and a pen, take some notes, or at least take some mental notes, and let me know your thoughts on the things you're learning as well over on social media. And one of the first questions that I wanna talk about is, what shifted in your life that helped you go from broke to actually having money? And the biggest thing for me was overcoming the fear of money. And I didn't understand how money worked. I just was like, okay, my parents paid for things, you know, there was food on the table, the, the house was paid for, the rent every month. I just showed up into the world and I had no understanding of how to make money, the language around money, accounting, saving, investing. I just didn't know. And so I was afraid of it. I was afraid of it. And the things we fear, we usually want to run away from. So if you don't understand it, if you don't have a sense of peace when you hear about money and we talk about money when money is in your hands if you feel afraid then why would more money come to you so some of the things that that i did and i recommend doing is number one is to surround yourself with people that have more money than you usually when you're around people that have it you can start to learn okay what are they doing differently that allows them to get money you can ask those questions and, I, and number two would be to talk about it consistently and i just remember i didn't talk about it much because i was afraid about it so if you start having conversations, it doesn't become as scary anymore. You can have more peace of mind, more ease, the more you talk about it. When you resist something, when you don't want to talk about something, you're saying, I don't want this in my life. I'm afraid of this, so I'm not going to talk about it. Or we don't talk about these things because it's private conversations. It's private to me personally. So if you're hoarding something that's private to you as opposed to being open and flowing and talking about it consistently, then it's going to be harder for money to come and go into your life. So you want to be willing to have conversations consistently and talk about it. Number three would be to read about it, learn about it. Money is a language. The terminology, the way people communicate about it is a language, just like the English language, just like playing a sport, just like working at a company. There's languages and terminologies that people use in different areas of their life. And money is no different. So you want to learn about as much as you can. Read books about it. At the end of this, I'll talk about some of my favorite books that I have right here that I'll go into about money and how to earn more and how to attract more money in your life. But I started to consume a lot of books. I started to listen to podcasts, watch videos, and just try to learn from people who were already making money and hear the language. And even today, there are still terms that I don't fully understand around money. There's still part of the language that I don't get, that I don't fully understand. So I'm constantly learning at different levels and different seasons of my life. Number four, a mentor of mine early on said, his name is Chris Hawker. I said uh, I was doing like an internship for him for a number of months. And after a while, I was sick and tired of being broke and I wasn't making any money. And I said, man, I could really use some money right now. And he said, money comes to you when you're ready for it. And I always remember this line because we were going on a walk and I remember the feeling of overwhelm and stress and not having enough to pay for things and feeling like, you know, am I ever going to make any money? Is it ever going to come to me? And he said, money comes to you when you're ready for it. And I remember saying vividly, I was like, I feel pretty ready to make some money right now. Like I could use this money. Like it helped me like pay for rent and food and have more opportunities. I can't buy clothes, gas, money, all this stuff. And Looking back a couple years later after that, I realized that I wasn't ready for it then. I needed it, but
but I wasn't ready for the abundance of money to start coming in because I wasn't educated enough. I didn't know how to manage money. I was afraid of it. I wasn't talking about it. I wasn't doing these things I just talked about. And so therefore, if money came to me, I would probably do the wrong things with it. I wouldn't know how to invest it. I would spend it poorly or maybe I would hoard it because I'd be so afraid, but I wouldn't know how to let it flow in and out of my life. And so money comes to you when you're ready for it. And it means you've got to be prepared for it. You've got to learn about it before it comes to you. You got to study it. You got to talk about it. You got to do those things. And the, the fifth thing would be to learn how to earn it, spend it, and invest it to work for you. And when you're just starting out, it's going to be hard to do that. You're not going to know, well, how do I invest this when I'm only making a little bit every month? But at least learning about investing, learning about what's the best way to spend my money. You know, people earn it and then they spend it on dumb things. You're, they spend it on things they think are smart, but they're not the best things. So you just want to learn as much as you can in the process. And that'll support you in really setting yourself up for the next step. And the next question is, what mindsets around money did you have to overcome? And one of the big things for me was, am I worthy of money? Do I deserve money in my life? Am I a good enough human for money to come to me? And I think, am I enough is something that so many of us ask ourselves, or we've asked ourselves at different moments in life. Am I enough for this relationship? Am I enough for this opportunity? Am I enough for this job for this uh, this accomplishment? Am I enough? Do I belong? Do I fit in? And so realizing that you are worthy is one of the biggest things that I had to overcome in terms of I've never made money and now how am I going to start making money? It's realizing that I'm worthy of receiving it. And I also had to come overcome the challenge of would anyone ever pay me for skills that I don't have? When I was transitioning from uh, 23, 24 year old from football into kind of the the business and career workforce, I didn't know what skills I had. So the limiting belief of would anyone give me money for a skill that I don't have? I don't know what they are, so I have to figure out what they are or I have to develop new skills. I also ha had a mindset that was, I'm too young. Why would anyone pay me if I'm too young? I'm too inexperienced. I'm not qualified, etc. These were all limiting beliefs that held me back early on. But when you can flip these things into, I'm too young, but I have energy, I have youth, I have passion, something that maybe older people don't have. And when you use it to your advantage and not your disadvantage, that's when you can really start to accelerate things. So I'm not experienced, but I'm more passionate than anyone else. I'm willing to try new things. I'll say yes to anything to gain the experience. Or someone else with a lot of experience will probably say no to a lot of things because they've already worked their way to get there. I'm not qualified. Well, I'm not qualified, but I'm willing to take on multiple different projects to get qualified. I'm willing to do what it takes to gain the skills. So having that energy, that willingness, that passion, that hunger, people are inspired by that. People want to have people on their team. They want to hire people in that position. So make sure that you figure out what your limiting beliefs are and use them towards your advantage, not your disadvantage. But those were some for me. Next question is, what do you do differently now than when you were poorer that makes you more money? And one of the things that I really learned from many different mentors is having recurring revenue streams. So I have, over the last few years, set up my business to have multiple reoccurring revenue streams. And I didn't have this for the first six or seven years. It all relied on me showing up every day, selling something to earn money, and then paying the team, paying the expenses. But it all relied on me showing up every day, every week, every month to sell something, to then bring in money to help pay for things. And it, it's hard if it's all relying on you every single day to help pay for everything. So instead, I started transitioning our, our business to make money to be able to take care of our team and the expenses so I don't have to be the only one that is relied on to earn revenue and bring it in. And we did that through setting up reoccurring revenue streams in our business. Things like the podcast, things like YouTube, things like a membership site, things like a coaching program that has reoccurring payments. And these reoccurring revenue streams, they rely on me to create but more from an evergreen place, not from a place of, I need to do this now, today, in order to generate sales, in order to generate revenue. 
So how can I spend my time today so that we generate revenue consistently based on those efforts? And that's just something that took time. It took time for me to develop skills, to get experience, to build confidence, to make mistakes in order to figure out how to do that. And that's, I think, something that people would want to learn about in the future. So what are the best investments that I've made? The, the best investment is always the ones in myself and back into my business. I've made multiple different investments in, in lots of different ways that never worked out. And if you want to hear another episode about all the investments I made that were bad investments, then let me know in the comments below if you want me to do a solo episode on what not to invest in. And we'll, we'll do that. But the ones that have always paid off are the ones in, I've invested in building team, building tools for my team, building, investing in software and things to automate things within our team. Anything investing back in our team at Greatness Media, that has always been a great investment because it allows us to reach more people, allows us to help and impact more lives, and allows us to generate more revenue for the business so I can continue to pay the team, pay myself, and build the mission. That's number one, putting into the business. The second thing is like really back into myself. And I think this is the greatest investment you can always do is back into yourself. So health being number one. Without health, it's hard to build wealth because there's some type of saying out there that a wealthy man has a million problems, a sick man has one problem. And when you're sick, you, it does, nothing else matters except for how do I get healthy? How do I get back on my feet? How do I get rid of this disease, this sickness, this thing that's holding me back? The other problems in the world don't matter until you get your health right. If the, your health is not right, that's going to be the only thing. So for me, I'm investing in nutritionists. I'm investing in coaching and trainers for my health and wellness, for my physical body. I'm investing in quality foods, organic foods. I'm at a stage where I can invest in those things now. But when I was younger, I was investing in ramen noodles and... Uh, ice cream, you know, that was like all I could afford. So now it's optimizing health and thinking about that. I'm investing in skills. For me, I'm all about how can I maximize more skills because the more skills I have, the more potential I can connect with other people. I can relate to other people. I can build my business in that way as well. And it's just more fun and enjoy enjoyable for me. And I think a rich life comes down to more than financial riches. It comes down to having a rich, fulfilling life, doing the things that you enjoy, doing the things that, that bring you more love, that bring you more fulfillment, that, that inspire you, that make you feel more alive. For me, that's a rich life. And just having money and not having that is a poor life. So I'm thinking about how can I enrich myself with activities, hobbies, adventures, magical moments that bring me more joy, that bring me more freedom, fulfillment, because that is where the riches lie personally for me. So skills that I'm investing in, going back into salsa dancing classes, Spanish lessons, because I really want to learn Spanish, uh, learning about businesses, learning new ideas about investing, like skills that excite me, that, that light me up. Um, investing in friends and loved ones, whether it be just taking a friend out for lunch or coffee and investing financially with, with that there by paying for the tab and also investing my time and energy into them and loved ones, taking care of the people when I can, when it works for me as well. And then also, I like to invest in experiences and adventures. I was thinking about this last night with a friend of mine. I was reflecting on travels of my past and I was like, wow, I've really been to a lot of countries. I've really experienced so many different cool moments in my life because I invested in travel, I invested in experiences, I invested in trips and adventures with good people. And it's cool to be able to have these memories and be able to experience these moments on a consistent basis. So that's what I like to invest in personally for me. Next question is, what are the three most important things to do to start building wealth? Something I want to always go back to is surround yourself with uh, a mentor who's done it and learn from them. It's really hard to do something that you've never done before without having a model or a mentor who can guide you, or at least someone you can watch from afar and learn from. You can watch their content or YouTube or books or something. 
It's hard to do it on your own if you don't have that. So I really try to surround myself with the people who are the masters of the skills that I'm trying to learn, who are masters in business, if I'm trying to build my business and, and learn more from them because they're at a place that I'm not at yet. So I want to surround myself with them and then learn and apply it. The second thing would be to create a game plan with structure and processes around how to build your wealth from these mentors, from this information you're learning from. So really get clear on, okay, what is it that I want and why do I want this? Whether it's a financial goal or any type of goal in your life, you want to get clear on what you want, why you want it, and then put a date around a goal of when you want to accomplish that goal. For me, that will allow you to have structure. It'll allow you to have time and space to create and reflect on. It'll allow you to have moments where you can create processes in place. It'll allow you to break down goals. It'll allow you to see what's working, what's not, all these different things. But if you just say, I want to make more money, and you don't have a date, and you don't have a game plan behind it, it's going to be hard to accomplish that. So really create a structure around learning this and give yourself some time and space to grow. And the third thing would be, I just think it's so important for me, it's so important to be joyful and service focused. Joyful and service focused. When you're trying to build wealth or trying to generate more revenue for your business, people want to be around those who are joyful. No one wants to be around someone who's negative, someone with low energy, someone who's distracted, someone who's complaining. No one wants to be around that person. They want to be around positive energy, joy, someone who's happy, grateful. Now, you're not going to be this all the time, but I'm telling you, the more you can be in that space, the more you will find financial opportunities coming your way. So it's, it's kind of like the pre-step, the pre-habit to all the habits of, of building wealth and the millionaire mind is coming from a place of joy. Even when you have nothing, because there are people that I want to be around. There's people that I've met in the past who have nothing, but they bring joy to the moment. And I'm like, I want to be around that girl. I want to be around that guy because they just bring more energy to maybe a challenging day. If you have joy, it's one of the greatest currencies you can have. Even if you don't have other skills, you don't have opportunities to bring someone, joy can be your, your ticket the key to unlocking the door to riches. And so thinking about, I think it was Zig Ziglar who said, if you want to accomplish your goals, find a way to help everyone else accomplish their goals. I'm paraphrasing this here. But find a way to help everyone else accomplish their goals. And by doing so, it will come back to you. You'll be surrounded by the right people to help you accomplish your goals. Another question is, how can someone 10x their income if they run their own business? And... You want to think about these key things, increasing your prices, increasing your prospects, increasing products, increasing process, and increasing your personal brand. So if you've got a business right now and you've got a product or a service, the first thing you can think about is of these five things, how can I increase my, my rates? How can I increase my, my, my price on this product or this service? That's a way you can start earning more right there. Is your product amazing? Can you make it better? If so, then you can increase your prices. Is it getting incredible results for people? Awesome. Increase your prices. Is your coaching or consulting helping people? You over delivering? Awesome. Think about increasing your prices. Number two, prospects. This is uh, how are you getting more leads to come in to sell your products or services? So you got to think about how can I increase my prospects? If you want more results, you need more people to be aware about you. Number three, increasing products. Maybe you've only got one offering right now. Can you offer something else to reach a different demographic? Maybe people can't afford a certain price you're at, but they could afford something a little bit lower. Or maybe there's a tier up that you could charge for people. And right now you're only offering a lower number, but you should be charging something else for a different service or product. So increasing the amount of products in your product suite can support you in 10 x your business. Number three, the process. If you haven't optimized the process for your business, meaning how can I streamline things? How can I save time? How can I get software and tools to support me in automating things 
so that I can invest my time back in prospects, back in products, et cetera, and start thinking about how can I optimize the process for myself and for my team. Number five, I've got one more for six. Number five is, is increasing your personal brand because the evidence is showing more and more that um, people with CEOs with personal brands or individual personal brands in general are more trustworthy and more likely to get opportunities. So finding ways to build your personal brand, whether that's creating free content online, showcasing your skills and talents, whether that's doing collabs with people, whatever it might be, but putting your personal brand out there with your wisdom, with your information, with your knowledge, with your skills, with your talent, with your teaching, building your personal brand. And I'd say the sixth thing, if I was going to add one more thing there, is uh, increasing the quality of the people you're surrounded by, the people on your team. So we've got prices, prospects, product, process, and personal brand. And then the sixth thing would be uh, building a quality team of people around you and making sure that the people are supporting this as well. As we have increased our team, our opportunities for growth has come financially as well. And that takes time, that takes energy, that takes training, it takes you know, onboarding, teaching, all these things, but that process alone by bringing in great people will support you in your growth. Next question, if someone is an employee, how can they start to make more money? Well, I really like to think about, the first thing is here, what's the value you're bringing to the current company that you're with? If you're creating a current value right now, can you approach the leadership team or the CEO or your boss and say, hey, listen, I've been here for a certain amount of time and here's the value I've created. I would like to create a game plan for creating more value and creating bigger results. Results that can save the company money, results that can make the company money or save the company time. And here's my game plan. So you taking the time because usually when you go to a job, uh, you're going to get a set rate and you're expected to get the results that you're paid for that rate. So you got to go above and beyond to really be considered for a raise and, or a significant raise for most companies. And what I would do is say, listen, I really value my time here. I love what I'm creating here. I love where I'm at, but I want to grow and I want to help this company grow with me showing you how I can create more value in this process. And then give a game plan to your boss or your leadership team or whoever and say, here's what I'd like to create. Here's what I propose. I propose I step into this role. I step into this new role where I could get a raise and here are the results that I could create for the business. Here's how it's going to make the business more money. Here's how it's going to save time. And here's how it's going to save money. If you can show that you can do all three of those things with a clear game plan and you can actually execute it without it taking more resources necessarily or time of the, the leadership team or your boss or whoever it might be, that will set you up for a greater chance of earning more if you're working for a company right there. Showing that you care, showing that you want to do just more than the bare minimum will set you up for success in that way. But you've got to be the one to take charge to make that proposal. You've got to be the one to step up and say, here, I've got the game plan mapped out. Here's what I'm thinking. I want to go do it. Let me test it for three months. And if we get these specific results, then I'd love to be rewarded or considered for a raise or considered a bonus, whatever it might be. So that's something I would think about right there is really approaching that. And I don't know if most employees are thinking about it that way, but if you can think about how can I earn, help the company earn more, save more time or save more money, then you should definitely be considered for that. And, and, on, and I want you to think about like consulting at nights or on the weekends. Listen, you've got your full-time thing and that's bringing your full-time check. That's great. So you've got extra time at nights and on the weekends. So if you wanna earn more, you gotta be putting in extra time of thinking about, okay, how can I use my skills? How can I use my knowledge? How can I use my collaboration skills? Whatever it might be to either consult, to coach, to launch a product or a side hustle, uh, and to start earning more on the side. All things take time. And you've gotta build your personal brand, you gotta build your contacts, you gotta build your uh, content, whatever it might be that your skill is in, and start doing that at nights and on the weekends if you wanna earn more. How can I use the law of attraction to build wealth? Well, another one of my mentors said that the, the world makes room for passionate people. The world makes room for passionate people. So how do you want to use the law of attraction to build wealth? 
is to be passionate, is to be joyful like we talked about before. I'm really clear on setting my intention in a daily basis. When I wake up, I say thank you. I say thank you for another day because we don't know if we're going to wake up tomorrow. We don't know. We, we hope. We, we've woken up for so many years for now, so we assume it's going to happen, but we just don't know. And there are people that will go to bed tonight that won't wake up tomorrow in the world. This will happen. We don't know. It could be me. It could be you. And we don't know. And Every breath we take right now is closer to our last breath we will ever take. So I really think about my intention in the morning. Thank you. I'm here another day. I get to help someone else today. I get to make an impact today. I get to use my skills and talents with where I'm at in my life right now to make a difference. Whether that's smiling at someone, whether that's giving someone a hug, or using your skills to support someone in their life. So set your intention and think about it daily and act on it daily and let people know what your dream is in the process of helping them. So when you're clear on your intention and every morning you think about it, you're thinking about it. I like to write down my goals. I hang them up. So I'm looking at my goals. They're in my eyesight. So I'm not distracted thinking about everything else. And then daily acting on it. Set your intention. Think about it. Look at it. Daily action. And while you're supporting other people accomplish their goals, you let them know what your dreams are in that process. For me, that's the recipe. That's the the recipe for the law of attraction and, and attracting things by you thinking it, looking at it, acting on it daily. And then while you're helping other people through your skills and talents, you're talking about what your goals are, what your dreams are that you've been acting on daily. Not just oh, this is something I want to do in the future and I'm thinking about it and I haven't done anything for years about it, but you're actually putting in the work on a daily basis to build reps, to build material, to build skills, and to build confidence. That's something to think about on the Law of Traction. We also have a number of videos and interviews about wealth and the Law of Attraction. So if you're over on YouTube right now, make sure to check out. We should have some stuff linked up where you can see more videos on the Law of Attraction and generating wealth for your life. Next question is, what are the best books to learn about making money? There are a number of books that I like, and I actually had a a, a few books on my bookshelf. These aren't all the books that I would recommend. There's definitely more, but I just wanna share a few of them that I have here on my shelf that I really like. Uh, The first one is Think and Grow Rich. If you haven't checked out this book yet, make sure you check it out. I just think it's got timeless wisdom and some great stuff. This is a book I read when I had no money and I went through this and there were some incredible ideas that just helped me overcoming the fear of money. Helped me overcome, helped me understand money a little bit more from a philosophical understanding. So this helped me take action, it helped me get clear, it helped me think differently, it helped me overcome fears. So Think and Grow Rich is definitely one that I recommend. The Richest Man in Babylon, uh, this one has sold uh, millions of copies. I think it's a great story, again, to help you be more inspired. So The Richest Man in Babylon. I really like this. This is a big book, but I read this thing cover to cover. And for me, it's hard for me to finish a book cover to cover. But I was really inspired because, like I said, there's a language about money that can be daunting, that can be confusing, that can be scary because you don't know what these words are in the terminology and the languages. So this book by Tony Robbins, Money Master the Game, The Seven Simple Steps to Financial Freedom. Freedom. I've done an interview with Tony on this book. We'll link it up somewhere so you can go check that out as well. But this was a powerful interview that I did where Tony dives in deeper about this. So I recommend getting the book, but it's like, I don't know, 600 something pages. So you can start with the video or the episode first on the audio or YouTube, but this is a game changer. And it's really teaching you about how to invest your money in a powerful way so that you can be financially free for the rest of your life with the right investment strategies. Really good one. I like that a lot. Money, master the game. This is by my friend David Bach. David Bach's got a number of New York Times bestsellers, uh, but this is a short uh, book, his most recent book, called The Latte Factor, Why You Don't Have to Be Rich to Live Rich. And I think this kind of goes into what I was talking about at the beginning of this episode where 
For me, a rich life is not about having all the money in the world. Having all the money in the world can solve a lot of problems, but it doesn't solve every problem. It can pay for your rent, it can pay for trips, it can pay for nice things, food, it can help people, you can pay for your health insurance bills, like it can do things to definitely help you in a big way. But it doesn't mean you have a rich life if you have a lot of money. It doesn't mean that. There is someone, I live in a building here in Los Angeles, and there's someone who committed suicide last year who is reportedly worth hundreds of millions of dollars, who is so well connected in Hollywood, connected to presidents, and looked like he had it all. He had all the money, had the success, had the fame, but for whatever reason, he committed suicide. And it just made me reflect that like, there might be some stuff inside of us that if we don't feel rich inside, it doesn't matter how rich we are on the outside. And this is all about why you don't have to be rich to live rich. And I think if you can understand this principle first about building the riches within you, not thinking about how can I create wealth outside, but when you build it on the inside first, then when you have it, you can understand it more. It doesn't consume you, it doesn't control you, it doesn't manipulate you, it doesn't own you. Because I've seen it for too many people that money becomes an obsession that then owns them and controls them. You hear the term, more money, more problems. This is real if you don't know how to manage it. And this is also why some people sabotage themselves because they make a lot of money, then everyone has their hand out and says, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give I want money, can you help me here? You've got it, so why can't you just pay this 5,000 from here, 10,000 here, can you pay off my debt? Can you pay for this, can you pay for this? And it becomes overwhelming because people feel like they're getting taken advantage of, it feels like they're being used and abused, they feel like people are only in their life because they have money. And so this is why some people become you know, jerks or distant or whatever they might be going through because they don't feel like your relationship or your connection with them is coming from appreciation or from true friendship. And that's a challenging thing. So you've got to understand if you don't have money, and someone who does have it, and you're acting and you're saying, well, why aren't they doing this? And why aren't they doing that? And why are they acting weird? Because they probably have everyone asking them for something as opposed to asking them, you know what, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? What can I do for you? Everyone's always asking what can they do for, for them, right? They always want something from them. So you got to be aware of that. Make sure you build a rich life from within. I like David Bach's book. Again, he's got many other great books around money, but this one is a recent one that I really like that was on my shelf. These last two that I have on my shelf that I like that I pulled off, uh, both of these guys I've interviewed. We've got Ryan Serhant, Big Money Energy, How to Rule at Work, Dominate at Life, and Make Millions. If you guys don't know Ryan Serhant, make sure to check him out. Uh, just did a full interview about him in this book. Again, it kind of goes back into big money energy, the energy you bring to deal making, to getting a job, to building a business, like the energy you bring to attracting. We talk about the law of attraction, it really is an energy thing. It stems from your attention, your joy, your level of passion, your level of enthusiasm, your positivity. That's where the rich life starts. If you have nothing, but you have big energy, that's a rich life. And that's where you can start to attract financial riches as well. So check out Big Money Energy. And then I saw uh, Chris Hogan, Everyday Millionaires, How Ordinary People Built Extraordinary Wealth and How You Can as well. He surveyed a bunch of millionaires and learned about the strategies they used to generate their millions. And he talks about this in this book. We did a full interview with him as well, Everyday Millionaires. If you want to check that out. These books are for people at different stages. You know, maybe you don't want to start with Tony Robbins if you have no money uh, to even invest. This might be, okay, I've got some money. I need to learn how to invest. What should I do with it? So check out the books based on the stage that you're at. If you're, if you're kind of just getting started, then I would go back to this one. Think and Grow Rich, so you make sure you check this one out as well. This has sold a lot of copies over the years. And that is my, my strategies, my books, my insights. And, and, I'll, and I'll leave you with this. You know, also, if you want more episodes like this, more solos like this, then please let us know in the comments over on YouTube uh, below this video and let us know what topics you'd like me to cover and go into. But here's what I will say. Money is definitely an energy and a journey. Money comes and goes. Uh, the more you hold on to it, the less more is going to come to you. 
the more you're willing to invest it in things and, and spend it and let it flow, the more will flow to you. So you got to learn the balance. You don't want to spend it all, all the time. So you have none. But you want to make sure you're willing to invest it in certain things that make sense. And the more free you feel about it inside, the less scarce you feel about it, the more will come to you. And you also just feel more at peace. This takes time. For me, I didn't have a good relationship with money growing up. I didn't understand it. I didn't get it. I was afraid of it. I was afraid to talk about it because I was ignorant to how it worked. When you learn about how money works, which could be a lifelong journey. This isn't just like, okay, I read a book and I get it now. This is a lifelong journey based on the season of life you're at with your money. And at different seasons, you're going to need to learn new lessons. You're going to need new mentors and friends to support you in learning about this. You're going to need new books, new tools to learn about investing, saving, taxes, all these different things are to come to you. Accounting, just dealing with it all, it can seem overwhelming. And this is why when things are overwhelming, sometimes people don't even want to look at it. And if you don't understand it, I'm telling you, it's going to be hard for it to keep coming your way or you're always going to feel like you're behind. I'm behind on payments, I'm behind on debt that I got to pay off and you're never going to feel caught up. So this is a, this is a skill you want to master. Money is going to be a part of your life for the rest of your life for probably 99.9% .9 of the, the population. And it's going to be something you're going to need to learn how to continue to evolve into understanding. And the more you do that, the more you talk about it in a positive way, the more positive it will be with you. So think about these things. Leave a comment below of what you thought was the most powerful part about this. And what I want to do right now is actually add a couple of clips more about wealth, the law of attraction around money, millionaire habits, and how you can really start earning more wealth for yourself and uh, the habits of what some of the richest people in the world do right here on the School of Greatness. So thank you guys for watching. We'll dive right into these clips right now. Everything is about the whole intuition part, right? You're sitting there, who you choose to befriend, who you choose to have relationships with, mm -hmm. you know, and how you water those relationships. Because if you want to have a relationship together and it's just take, 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 nothing's going to happen. I remember I'm a 24-year-old kid. Uh, I don't know nothing about business. I've done some stuff in sales, but I really don't know nothing about business. I'm, I'm a 22-year-old kid. I go and I take this guy. I go to a job interview at the advertising group. Shout out to Jamie Hepp. And I watch this guy. He interviews me. I'm, I'm at that time working on Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, but I'm trying to see what else I want to do. Okay, So I got started the day before 9-11, but I'm wow. still interviewing. I sit with him in the interview, and the way he interviewed me, I sat there and I said, I will never work for this company because it's just not what I want to do because they were selling Xerox machines and uh, business to business. I said, but I want to have a relationship with you. I said, do you mind if I get your business card? He said, yeah, sure. I said, okay, great. So he gives me his business card. Year and a half later, I get a job. I'm doing good at this point. I'm making some income, 23 years old. I call him up and I said, Jamie, you don't remember me, but I want to take you out to lunch and I want to pick your brain if you don't mind. I told you a year and a half ago that I wanted to do this with you. You said, yes. He says, great, let's do it. So we go to Macaroni, Macaroni Grill, somewhere in Culver City, right around here, like uh, Victory, uh, uh, Overland, some, somewhere around that area. So we go there, he brings this drop dead gorgeous girl that works for him. I think her name is Natalia or Natasha or something with Ann, right? And she's beautiful, short skirt, perfect legs, flawless, beautiful face. She's sitting right there, and I know what he's trying to do. He's trying to woo me to go be one of his sales guys. And I said, look, with all due respect, you're beautiful, but I have no interest in you. My interest is in you. Is it fair if we just talk business for an hour? Wow. He says, yes. So I went, okay? Now, at this point, he's making a million. I'm making 50 grand here. I'm a nobody, okay? We have lunch again. I'm taking notes, taking notes, taking notes. I offer to pay. He doesn't let me pay. He pays. He says, I got it. No problem. When I leave, I send him a book. We had this meeting that we did every three to six months together at this restaurant, Argentinian restaurant called Bamboo, which they had this beautiful uh, uh, soup. Every time we would have dinner with him or we'd go to lunch, I would always send him a book. Ten years later, he says, every time I meet with Patrick, a book is on its way. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I valued the relationship. I asked him, what do you need from me? Mm -hmm. How can I bring things to you? Years later, he gives me one referral. That one referral he gave me helped me open up Florida. If he doesn't give me that referral, that Florida office wouldn't have been opened up, wow. right? One contact opens up a whole state, okay? So 
Another relationship I can tell you about is I was going to churches and I said, let me see what's going to happen with these churches. And I'm going to churches and I'm going to these different places. And I'm having I'm studying Scientology. I'm studying LDS. I'm studying Jehovah Judaism. I'm studying everything. At this point in the game, I was obsessed with religion. So all I want to do is study, study, study everything about religion, right? Hmm. And I'm 24, 25. I eventually find this church called Shepherded, Shepherded Hills, which is ran by a guy named Dudley Rutherford. And I go to this place. And I'm, not, I'm, an, I'm an atheist, so it's not like I'm going in there. I'm just trying to see what's going on over here. Trying to learn. I'm yeah. just trying to learn. I'm not trying to do it. I go to this place, and I'm like, okay, I like this guy's style. You know, typically, you go to church. If you don't do this, you don't know hell. And I'm like, dude, I don't need to know I'm going to hell. I know I'm going to hell. I just want to know I was shot in heaven. You know what I'm saying? So this guy's energy was, you have a shot at uh -huh. heaven, right? I'm like, okay, cool. All right. I'm a, this is my try. I feel a little better, right? I know the scrubs for what I've done in my life. Let me see. Maybe I got a shot over here. So I go there, and I'm uh, sitting in the back. I watch him once, twice, three times, four times. I'm like, wow, this, I like this guy. So then I sent him an email. A little bit of an arrogant email, but I'll tell you what the email was. I sent him an email, and I said, listen, my name is Patrick Bay David. You don't know who I am, but I'm going to be somebody in the world. Mm. And I, I know you are somebody in the world, but I promise you, if you give me your time, I will always bring value to you. Wow. It will not be a waste of your time, okay? I'm not doing anything at that time at 25. I'm, I got a small little office operation, nothing crazy. We go have a lunch together at Black Angus. Black Angus off Canoga or Topanga. We go to Black Angus, we sit down, we talk. After the meeting is over with, I said, what can I do for you? Nothing there. We go out again, what can I do for you? Nothing there, what can I do for you? Nothing there. Eventually, says something happened with my son at Moore Park Basketball, and I made a phone call to the coach, and I spoke to the guy. And anonymous, anonymously, because I didn't like the way uh, this whole situation was handled. He probably doesn't even know the story. I know the, the people may know, but he may not even know the story. So, um, so I make the phone call. We get closer. He marries my wife. We, we change our wedding to Friday. It was set up on Saturday to Friday so he can wed us. Mm -hmm. Anyways, in 2008, 2009, 2008, he introduces me to Tom Ellsworth. You know how I talked about Tom earlier? Mm -hmm. He introduced me to mm -hmm. Tom. Okay? And Tom comes. Okay? In 2009, he introduced me to Matt Sapala. Matt Sapala and Sheena. I got introduced to 09. They just got promoted this last week at West Palm Beach to the Chief Distribution Officer PHP, right? Mm -hmm. He is now the CDO, okay? We've paid him in the first six months of the year over a million dollars. They're, they're doing very good at what they do in the business wow. here. But if I don't have that contact and I water him what his needs are, not what I can take. Yep. If I give the needs you, I don't have those contacts. So I think too many times when, you know, you build a relationship with somebody, it's immediately what can I do, you know, uh, uh, what can I, and by the way, what, I can, I, the what can I get from Yeah, you? and I remember how you were the first time we met. You know, uh, when we were done, you and I went to Earth Cafe with Jan, and I think we even went and looked at some furniture, and there was like a Google shop that we went there. I don't know if you remember yeah, that, yeah, off yeah, of a, around, right yeah. across from Earth Cafe. And, and you said, Pat, how can I help you? What do you need from me? Mm -hmm. You know, what can I do for you? It was on the corner. How we, after exactly. Out. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, I'm like, so we walked around. I mean, babe, she said, yeah, I really like this Lewis guy. I don't like this approach, how he is. That's the dynamic that you yeah. don't see behind closed doors. People yeah, yeah. may see School of Greatness. People may see the books. But behind closed doors, the context mm -hmm. is about what can I do for you. So you ask three things. I'd say the biggest one is figure out ways to strengthen relationships and take them deeper because you never know. Just like everybody thinks you're you know, one sale away or one opportunity away, you're one contact away from your life changing. Mm -hmm. If you start valuing your contact like a book of business, yeah. everything changes. That's true. What I heard you say there was intuition, study, and relationships. Sure, yeah. Does that cover those mm -hmm. kind of three oh, things? Yeah. And I think when you think about people that aren't making the money that they want and don't have a rich life, whether that be quality of life, they probably aren't discerning their decisions and being intuitive about who they should spend time with. They aren't researching more ideas and expanding their mind and they aren't giving in those relationships. I would agree yeah, with that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think sometimes it's also not knowing what something could lead into. You know, a guy one time came into Morgan Stanley yes. Dean Witter in a Harley Davidson uh, bike and he had tattoos and he looked rough, very rough. No advisor would take him. He says, I'm looking for an advisor. No advisor would take this guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I need an advisor. Uh -huh. And they're like, oh, there's a bank downstairs. A financial advisor. Financial right? advisor. Yeah. Right? Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter, Glendale. No one wants to take this guy. Right. This guy's got no money. Yeah, so no the potential. guy comes out, he sees, he says, oh, just give him to somebody else. I'm good. The guy in the corner office that has a couple hundred million dollars under management, he leaves. Then the new guy takes him. Then the guy comes, have $50 million to invest. <laughs> he got an inheritance. 
That one account was fifty Change million. Changed his life. Changed his life. Yeah. And he put the 50, and the rookie b broker got a $50 million money under management. You're wow. getting one or two points on that. That's life crazy. changing. So the for life. Of, for life. Every year. Every year, generational wealth. We're not talking yeah. about like a small thing here. So you can't just sit there and look mm -hmm. at relationships that you never know the potential of a contact. You have to know every contact could take you to some place that you don't know. It's like a movie. You don't know the next scene. You know, so you can't just assume what that contact's going to lead into. Yeah. Sometimes the smallest contact can lead into something Gosh. big. One of the things I love about you, Patrick, is you remind me of my dad so much and my childhood. My dad, I think I told you, my dad was a life insurance salesman for 32 years until he got into a, a brain accident. He got in a car crash and he's still alive today, but he had to stop working. And he also became an entrepreneur, launched the health insurance vertical in, in, in conjunction with Northwestern Mutual. And um, he does everything you do. And my whole business model and just the way that I live is based on what I witnessed him doing. And this was pre-social media, pre-internet. Wow. He would just remember names like nobody's business. He was so giving, so thoughtful, and he was always thinking in the long term. He wasn't like, how can I sell you now, but how can I give you now? He would do this every day. He would read the newspaper and he would cut out the newspaper every day and write long letters and put in envelopes and send it out to people that were clients and people that are not clients. If it was someone's kid in sports that, you know, was, hey, they had their best game ever. Hey, I just wanted to send you this clipping wow. of the newspaper to just people in the community. That's on a whole different family. level though, man. That's and incredible. Handwritten letters and just send it to them and say, hey, you know, if I can ever wow. help with anything, let me know. Yeah. And it was that kind of old school mentality, but he would always just show up for people, just take meetings to take them. And it wasn't always trying to sell, but just trying to serve. And that's really kind of how I, I built my business early on was when I had nothing at all, I was just like, what can I learn from someone and how can I ask them what they need and then deliver on that need as fast as possible and not ask for anything in return. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've been able to grow is because of the relationship building. You know, Ben, our producer, I met him nine years ago when he was a, a student at Columbia Journalism School, uh, getting, getting your master's, right? And he was working on a documentary about handball. I was in handball at that time in New York City and really liked the way he made the documentary and followed his journey over the last nine years, stayed in touch every year. We needed a head producer to really build our content. And I reached out to him and the timing right, the sequencing was right. And we had the relationship where it made sense, at least for now, maybe he leaves at some point, but it's been great so far in the last four months. And I think you never know where the relationship will go. Even if it didn't work out, it's still worth building relationships. No question. Yeah. Even if we never work together. Because you just never know mm -hmm. who that person might introduce you to, who might say your name behind closed doors, where it unlocks some opportunity you never know. So you remind me a lot of my dad. Well, that that's a big yeah, compliment, yeah, yeah. man. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I think if more people came from that place of how can I just care about people and help them solve their problems, you're gonna gain a lot back in return long term, whether it's with that person or not. And you talk about money a lot on your show. And you have an amazing video about your top, I think it's your top 20 rules on money. I'm curious, since we're going into the rich poor conversation, what would you say are the top three to five rules on money if you could boil it down to three to five? It's a game. The number one rule is it's a game. You're playing a game, it's that simple, you know? Uh, if, you, if you look at it as a game, just like anything, you can get better at it, right? Like, I don't, whatever game you play, if you play Uno, if you play Monopoly, if you yeah. play Clue, if you play Fortnite. Jenga, if you play Fortnite, if anything you play, you know, you're gonna get good at it. I remember in my time, I was playing Fester's Quest, I played Zelda, Zelda yeah. I used to play Final Fantasy One, and I would play, um, obviously, Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, but it was also, uh, what was the Mario Kart, as a yep, Super Mario yep. Kart, I, and you know how you would do the three yeah, jumps yeah. and then bam, it's going fast. And I would beat <laughs> this time, 32 seconds, I was so proud of it, but I, I played it 50,000 times, right? right? So the game with money, it's, it's exactly what it is. Once you learn how to play the game with money, then it has to do with timing, then it has to do with different kind of things. Like, you know, a, a, a year ago, I get a call from a guy who needs cash. I said, okay. So like an, he needs an investment. He, he, he has something he has to sell immediately mm -hmm. to get cash in return, mm -hmm. okay? Because he needs the money right away. So I said, okay, so uh, what are you selling? He says, it's the two greatest Wayne Gretzky cards. I said, okay. Signed or unsigned? No, this is a <laughs> PSA 10 1979 OPG top. Signature? No signed, uh -huh. but it's the holy grail. So wow. the, the, the OPG one 
sold in 2016 for $453,000, okay? Wow. And just five years prior to that, it sold for $92,000. So from wow. 92,000 to 451 in 2016, and he calls me. And a top sold in 2016 for $205,000. So two cars combined sold in 2016 for 600 and, you know. He has them both. He has them both, and he wants to sell it to me. And I said, okay, what do you want to sell it for? He's like 600,000. <laughs> yeah, he says, of course he wants to. I said, I'm not going to pay you that. I mean, you, you know, he wants 650,000. So I'm not going to pay you that, but we talked about it. And eventually he gave me a number, right? And it was still a number. I had to still cough up, you know, half a million dollar che uh, check to the guy. But we met at the PSA headquarters, classy guy, total gentleman. We sat down, transaction happened. The CEO of PSA came, showed us the poster on the PSA headquarters. I think it's a new port of the card is on the wall. It's the most expensive hockey card in the world, right? Okay, no problem. So I mean, you're a hockey fan? I'm not a hockey fan. I'm an investment guy with hockey. But I've interviewed Wayne Gretzky six years ago. Wow. So I like greatness. Yes. I like anybody yes. that just goes and crushes it with mm -hmm. their game, right? So I buy this card. So I buy the card. I don't think much of One it. One card, not two. Two cards. It's both of them. I bought both of them, yeah. Wow. So the other guy who owns the card wouldn't sell his card for a million dollars if you paid it to him. So here's what I do so know. two guys own the card. Me and the other guy. There's only two of us, okay? okay? He, you paid a million, he won't sell it to you. So that means there's only one in the market, because it's me, because I'm willing to sell it, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's on eBay, right? If you go on eBay right now, you type in Wayne Gretzky, OPG, it's, it's on market right now for a million dollars, right? Wow. What, the, the, the one of them is on the market for a million, the other one's on the market for 400,000. So you asked me for rule of uh, money, I had cash. If I don't have cash like that, I can't double my money that quickly. So we just talked about three of them. Money's a game. You need cash because opportunity is going to come up and it's a doubles game. So if I a put doubles a game, it's a doubles game. Everything about money is a doubles game. What's that mean? A doubles game to me is I pay you $1,000. Can we double it in six months? No. How long in 12 months? Okay, no problem. I'll do a double in a, in a year. Here's $1,000. I get a double back, right? So if you take 1000 and you double it every year, what happens? 1000 goes into 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 256, 5, 12, a million. $1,000 is nine doubles away from a million. Wow. Now you take a million and see what happens if we double it nine times. One million goes into two million, four million, eight million, 16 million, 32. 64, 128, 256, 5, 12, a billion. A million is 10 doubles away from a billion. But how do you find the doubles? Well, that's the game. That's the part of the game. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So the, so the doubles now becomes investment opportunities. You know, what you buy into. Do you start a company where it has a high value, you know, you can really scale it and finding something that can scale? Do you invest into things that are gonna give you six, eight, ten percent, or are you gonna go play ball and take the risk? That, that's the game that you're gonna start learning. That, you know, part of my money is gonna be hedged and I'm gonna buy some gold because I'm not gonna become mm -hmm. a billionaire off gold, but I'm buying it because gold is money and something happens to the economy. I'm protected with the gold. But you know what? I'm gonna put some of this money in mutual funds because I know long term I'm gonna make eight to twelve percent on this. I'm fine with that. I might do a real estate deal because long term I may do some money, although right now commercial real estate may be an interesting uh, dynamic because I think Zoom crushed commercial real estate. The commercial real estate wow. model has, it's been crushed. Yeah. And by the way, it may never come back the same way ever again. Commercial Maybe real estate. 20 years from now or something, who knows? Oh, I don't even think, I think it's gone. Really? And the, here's what I mean, look, we have this space, right? Okay, mm -hmm. you got this space. If, did you get it in the last four months? How, how long have I you got had it? got it before COVID, okay, yeah, so, six months before, yeah. But if you get this today, if you get this today, right, right now, office space in Dallas, office space nationwide, companies are looking at their business models and they're just saying, why do I need 100,000 square feet of office space? Why do I need it? But if you go out there and you look at the numbers, you're like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to do commercial real estate, you know, but if I find some small, if I team up with a, a investment banker, if I team up with a guy that's managing money and I go with a VC team and this is a guy that's, you know, flipping opportunities fairly quickly and I dump a million dollars with him and within five years he turns a million dollars into five million, that's five X in five years. That may not be a bad idea. So you got to find those. And they're out there, by the way. Yeah. You have to, they're out there. So Ray Dalio plays a game of uh, doubles. Warren Buffett's a doubles game. All these guys are doubles game. And a lot is investing in businesses. Yes. I'm a business guy. Yeah. I'm not a real estate guy. There yeah. are people that are, and by the way, that doesn't mean real estate doesn't work. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense for me to say there's real estate billionaires mm -hmm. everywhere. Our president is a real estate billionaire. So for me to knock real estate would, would have no value to it. But for me, I'm more about, I have an idea. What are you guys doing? Me and Tiffany are thinking about starting a, uh, a marketing company. Okay, how, how can this thing scale? Well, let me tell you what we got. We got three packages, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be target audience. We're gonna be targeting 
people in this world. Okay, interesting. How much are you going to pay? We foresee us doing $6 million a year in revenue within 24 months. What have you done to be able to earn this? I'm a Columbia guy. I'm a this, I'm a this. I'm a... How much money do you need? I need $2 million. I can't give you $2 million. Can I come in for $100,000? I put $100,000. The next thing, this thing sells for $200 million. That $100,000 all of a sudden became $2.2 million. That's a victory. Mm -hmm. So those opportunities are out there. You just got to yeah. focus. And then the last one I would tell you with the money. So we talked about what? We talked about game. Money's a game. You need cash. You it's need a doubles game. Doubles game. Yep. And I'll tell you one more would be you have to be maniacally maniacal about being patient. Mm. I mean, you have to be patiently aggressive. You know, patiently aggressive. It's so tough to do. Because you want your money to double oh, now. Exactly. It might take 10 years. Yeah, but, but if you are willing to do the 10 years, it may double 40 times. Mm -hmm. It may double 30 times. You know, like when Bezos said, just hang tight. I'm not going to give you dividends. Just trust me on this. Trust me on this, right? And at the beginning, if you've heard the story where he goes and raises $2 million, from, uh, he gets $50,000 from 40 people. That's what, $2 million. Mm -hmm. And he gives them 20%. Wow. 20%. He gives up 20% of that 2 million. He gives them 20% just for $2 million. You know what that 20% wow. is worth today? $200 billion. Oh That's the point. So can you imagine 1994, Amazon gets started. Forget about you put 2 million. Just say you put 50 million. Wow. Just put, you put 50,000. What is a half a percent of a, two, of a trillion dollar company right now? A half a percent? You're still oh, a half exactly. a billionaire. Wow. Your 50,000 is worth $500 million, give or take whatever the numbers we're doing right. The, the point is, that is a massive victory. The guy who put $10,000 and he gave it to Berkshire Hathaway in 1974, I don't know if you've heard this story. Yeah. You know, Warren Buffett is starting, he says, I'll give you $10,000. Never touches the money. Goes back to his regular job, makes 100 grand a year. You know how much that 10, have you read this article? No, tell me. The $10,000, if you go on business inside of you, pull it up, is worth 780 today. 780? Million. Million. Wow. Never did anything to it. So, so that's the part about patiently aggressive. Yeah. It's very hard to do. But so the doubles get bigger later on, not yes, early on. The doubles do. are bigger your 15, 20, 25. That's what Papa talks about, just like his success is yeah. he's, he's lived longer. You yeah. know, he's just stayed around longer to let the money continue exactly. to compound. Yeah. And that compounded interest is where it's at. How do we negotiate with our mind to achieve something we've never achieved? Yeah, so the first thing to achieve is why do you want to achieve it? Mm -hmm. Like, what is your outcome? Right. Many of us walk into the room, even into the room when we're talking to ourselves, and they're not honest about the outcome. What is the outcome? Are you, why are you going through the motion? Is it because society has told you that that's what it should be? Or is it that your parents always wanted that from you? Or is it that you have been uh, neglected in some way and you're trying to please a bunch of people that you can't stand? Or is it that you want to change the world? Is it that you know that you being healthier is going to be uh, able to be around in your family's life much longer or you're going to be able to uh, stop some social injustices? Like, yeah. what is your why, first right. of all? That's the first step. That's Figure the, out why you want that thing. That's the first step. I, I always use this example, is, but people always say, well, I want to be a millionaire. Well, what are you going to do when you get a million dollars? Right. What are you going to do with the money? Some people go, well, I'm just going to keep making money. Well, how are... Is, Okay, you're gonna be a millionaire. So if, if over 65% of the lotto winners are broke three years after winning lotto, same thing with athletes. And football players, yeah. And fo football players, three years out of the league, they didn't know their why. The football player knew his why, or you know, he knew his why of, I wanna get that ball or run that play. Mm -hmm. I wanna become part of a championship team. Because I love it, or because it makes me fulfilled, or it's right. fun, or. I love going to the gym. I love, yeah. I love, the, I love the, I'm there for competition. You know competition, better than I do, yeah. because obviously you are an athlete. But if, if you don't know your why for a million dollars, well, when you get the money, you're gonna buy a Bugatti? Mm -hmm. You're gonna buy 10 cars? And then what? Yeah, but, but then you just have the Bugatti, right? So yeah, yeah. now what else you need, right? Are you gonna buy 10 cars? Are you going to move to Bali and live off $30,000 a year for 10 years, carve canoes, save the turtles, and invest in some stocks because stocks mm -hmm. are gonna average out 12% every year, and you're gonna turn the $600,000 into uh, whatever the case is, and then when right. you come back, like, what are you gonna then do? Yeah, yeah. yeah right, right, are you gonna buy investment properties and keep doubling down? Many people go through life without their why, and so when they're working that nine to five that, that they're sick of, they're going home and complaining, and, and you know, I, I, I forgot what I was, I was watching a show where a girl was, she was like, 
she was now living in nature, but mm. she said, I lived in Ireland and I was fighting every weekend <clears throat> in clubs and bars and I realized I was working and I was so miserable, so that was my release. So I was working to fight because I was so damn miserable with my life. And then she started to find causes that she liked. She stayed the job, but she would go home at night and put some time into causes that she liked. And she got able to get out of that circumstance and move to someplace else, and now she's doing what she loves. It's, but people right. don't know their why. Yeah. What's your why right now? You've been doing Shark Tank for what, 11 years now? Is that what it is? 11, 11 years. years. Going on 12 years You've been now. investing in a billion businesses, yeah. helping entrepreneurs grow. You've got you know amazing yeah. kids. Yeah. Yeah, so, so my why is, as I said before, first of all, uh, you know, it's to take care of my family and my, my wife and my, my youngest daughter, because my oldest daughter, daughters, when, uh, when, when they were born, I was poor, and all I knew was I got to go out and make as much money as I can to, give these, to get these girls uh, in an area where they're more protected, really? where they oh. can have a good education and have a medical and, and things that, in case something happens to them. And to break the cycle in my family of people who were just average people. My mother helped break that cycle by being one of the first to go to college. And me, I'm going to break that cycle. Mm. Next, but then I said to myself, but the little girl, now that I have the resources available, it's more how much love can I give her? Because I never had experienced the wanting to come home purely for love. I, I was just so focused on trying to make money because if these, if I didn't, if I wasn't successful, then like most parents, I'll sleep in a refrigerator box on the street if I have to to make sure those girls had just right. one place to live. So that's one of my whys. Also, you know, I've been on a show for 11 years that uh, uh, has changed the way that people uh, have uh, under understood or, or, or they get to educate themselves on being entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. I'm invested in various many companies. I'm these people's, uh, you know, uh, they allowed me to invest in their dreams. So who am I to give up? And also, I'm on the Petco board and the Petco Foundation, uh, you know, saving animals. I want to stop human traffic. I, mm. I have much more to do. Mm -hmm. And if I have a public platform that I can come and sit with you or go on GMA and stuff like that, and I can help change pe people's perception of whatever the case is, sex, gender, religion, whatever the case is, to, to make them realize that if I can do it, they can do it, then, mm -hmm. then I'm, I'm doing my job, you know? Where do you think you'd be had you not had your, your two oldest daughters? Do you think you'd have been as hungry to go earn Make a build a business, earn money, grow, or do you think like, okay, well, I have, I've got enough money for me. I don't know. You know, I I have, I was worth many millions of dollars by the age of thirty years old. I was absolutely broke and poor, and sleeping on the ground at twenty seven, um, at the ground of my house. And how and how old were you when you had your daughter, your first daughter? 20, 27, 26. Got you. Right. Wow. Um, and because of my daughters and my ex wife, I think that. They leveled me to some extent because you don't give a 30 year old guy from the hood millions of dollars in the bank wow. at 30 years old. Because yeah. I, I think I would have, I never tried cocaine or any of that stuff. But if I didn't have my girls, I probably would have been a huge supporter of cocaine because it looked like it was fun with the people having right. it. So I think that they, 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 they governed me in a certain way. Mm. Um, in a positive it, way. In a very positive way. And it yeah. made me also. It made me also want to live to leave my daughters a legacy. I wanted them to be proud of their father. Mm -hmm. So I refrained from doing and having a lot of the temptations that I've seen a lot of people fall, yeah. fall short and, yeah. and, and get caught up in and nothing wrong with that, but we're, we're all human. So I've, I've interviewed a lot of people and there's one side of the spectrum where these successful entrepreneurs say, you know what, Lewis? The key to growing your business is going all in on one focus. Mm -hmm. That's the key, right? That's what some say. Yeah. But there's others like yourself who've invested in every business in the world, it seems like, yeah. and seen lots of them grow and been successful in that way. Do you feel like, um, is that just like your, your creative nature where it's like you want to invest, this is your part of your path right now where you want to invest in lots of brands because you did so much in one thing for so long? No, I think, I think I, I'm more towards the person here. Um, so when I invest in brands and companies, um, I invest in them because they're, I'm allowing them to, they're allowing me to be part of their dream, but I'm also mm -hmm. learning from them, which really? is in return, allowing me to go back to my special skill set and improve it. So I'll give you so example. you're learning from the people you invest in a lot. I'm constantly learning wow. every single day. So 
in Power Shift, I had I, I highlighted my investment on Bomba Socks. Mm -hmm. Now these guys are the number one sock, the number one investment in Shark Tank history. The only the only the Ring who did not get an investment went and right. did really and well. Did a billion dollar. It did a billion yeah. two sale. It's crazy, right? Yeah, and and and, and good for and Jamie. You were there when. Yeah, I, I said no, and you know Jamie ended up becoming a guest shark one time, and that, he yeah. said he said when he came in the tank he was asking too much money, mm. and but but I believe that because we tenderized him like that and he went out and raised money, I think we deserve five percent, but that's just I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll leave it up to him. Yeah, exactly. But I think that that. I, I sent him an email yeah. every other day saying, yeah. hey, just 5%. All yeah. right, I'm, I'm willing to go four and a quarter. But, <laughs> well, uh, but, but the socks. But the socks. It's the best investment you made. And it's the number one It's the number one product in Shark Tank history. Really? In terms of how much it's grown? Or? How much it's grown and how much it's grossed. Really? Now, I want to make sure that you want to, because I know you interview a lot of people. Yeah. So if you ever interview the underachievers that sit next to me in the tank, I want to make sure that you remind them that you're the number one investor. I am King Kamehameha okay. on the tank. All right, just <laughs> okay. make sure it was clear. But um, let's give you that example. What was that deal? What was that deal and how big has it grown? Uh, they've done over $200 million. I think it's $280 million. Uh, more importantly, they're very, so their deal is a sock and every time you buy a pair of socks, they give a pair away to the homeless because they have a big mm, challenge. That's cool. And we don't normally talk about the number. It's more important that we've given away 30 million pairs of socks, that's right? That's pretty cool. Thank you, thank that's you. Cool. And, and it's really, it's really, uh, you know, Dave and Randy's company, and they, they've done it all. Um, I, I, they've gotten very little to almost no advice from me because they're so great. <laughs> yeah. But I'm gonna give you an example on the negotiation. They come into the tank, the only shark that doesn't want clothes is somebody who has 10 clothing companies and eight are dead. I. My, my, my reason for being on a tank besides investing in other people is to diversify my portfolio. So when I talk to a retailer, I go, well, I'm already mm. taking up real estate in the clothing area. I want real estate in electronics mm. area. I want real estate in lotion, da, da, da. The last thing I want is socks. Also, I have, I don't know, 20,000 units of socks that I can't sell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I, when I can't sell socks, I just send people over to people's houses, they steal one, yeah, yeah. and then you have to buy a pair because you just think you lost it, right? <laughs> so I still can't sell it. Plus, if I do the deal, I'm the logo whore. You can't tell, if anybody in this room or in this building were wearing bomber socks, you couldn't tell. Uh -huh. So how do I get the advertising out of it? Mm. But they managed to make me understand that today's generation wants to give every time they purchase instead of at the end of the year. They want impact. They want impact. They And they don't want to buy from people who are just making money. They want to know what did you do for somebody else. So that's one thing I learned that I applied to all my businesses mm. because I, I, you couldn't do that before social media. You could, but... You can't get the, the word out it, that much. And then yeah. plus you'd have to advertise off of people's hardships, yeah. right? You wouldn't have self-generated content of people mm -hmm. saying thank you, right? So I learned that. I also learned that because the consumer purchased and it was part of a movement, they talk about it at the dinner table, at the water cooler, and that's your advertisers. You don't need the traditional form of advertising mm. because people want to brag when they're doing something well. Yeah. And then last but not least, they were showing me how to sell directly to my consumer and not being at the mercy of a retailer who still doesn't know what they're doing. Mm. So right. they shifted the power in the room to get me to do a deal. So you weren't interested. I wasn't interested. Everyone else was. Everyone, no, not all, not well, everybody else was interested, more. but I was the last shark to be interested because I'm too jaded by the right. fashion industry. Yeah. Lo and behold, I do the deal, and that's what a power shift is, being able to know your target, wow. know what's beneficial for that person, know where you're willing to draw the line, and know, you know, really know how to relate to that person yeah. and communicate with them. What is it that they said that shifted the power inside of your mind to say, okay, I gotta get into this? Well, they showed me that the technology and the socks were really good because they didn't have the toe, the seam in the toe, when me being a manufacturer, mm -hmm. I didn't know how they did that at first. It was a simple change, but, I used to get irritated and nice. toes when you're doing that. Um, they then, but more importantly- you, can't put, you have to put it on a certain way. Yeah, yeah, of course. More importantly, they showed me that the data they received from their consumer was able to give them the ability to keep selling their consumer and keep talking directly to them and that they mm. no longer were at the mercy of if a retailer makes the best decision or puts your socks out over here or advertises your socks or discounts them or anything else, right? So they mm. were showing me how to control the business. It's very much like content sending it mm. out and, and getting to know a dashboard of your consumer. And I learned so much from them. But it was it was them understanding that, Damon, I'm gonna take you out of the old way of you doing business right. and move you into the new way of doing business. And guess what, if it doesn't work out, 
we're going to do another business together and we'll, we're going to make some money and, or change the world and more That's than cool. likely have some fun. That's cool. Who has taught you the most in the last 11 years of this show? Have them. You, them? They have. I learn, I learn I, you know, I joke about my fellow shots, but I definitely learn from Is them. Is that just because they pay you the most every month? <laughs> <laughs> you get a check every month? I, I see biggest? the business operating. I see, yeah. I, see them, I see them being laser focused. I mm -hmm. see a lot of things that they do. Uh, they have probably taught me the most. Yeah. Who was the, someone that you didn't invest in that taught you the most? Whether it be like a, a good lesson or a lesson you're like, okay, that's not what, that's what not to do. Somebody that I didn't. Or maybe someone inspired you, but you didn't see a right fit for you and they taught you something. Uh, you may, I, listen, I learned, I learned I, I'm not saying to be warm and fuzzy. Uh -huh. I learned from every single one of these entrepreneurs how they operate the business or how they fail. Yeah. A lot of time when they fail, it, re, it, 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 it confirms theories that I have. Um, because you know, whenever I fail, I look at a checklist of all the things, and I go, "Why didn't? Why did I do this? This is this mm. is this is not what I do. Yeah. Why? Why did I not take my own damn advice? Mm -hmm. You know. So um, I can't name just one of them. Sure, to tell you sure. the truth, you know. But you know, I I, I look at entrepreneurs like uh, Jeff Bezos and learn mm -hmm. and go. As big as you are, you are affecting the world, and you will still be scrappy enough to say. Hey, Amazon workers, you want to make a couple extra dollars when you're going home, you can take a package home and you let, why is that beneficial? Well, first of all, the worker gets to drive home and takes home a package and makes more money. You, you're a worker of Amazon, so Amazon trusts you with the box mm. and Amazon saves on shipping. Like takes a package home that you bought for something? No, or no, meaning... Just take anything you, you want. You, you no. Take it and drop it off. Oh, drop it off someone on your neighborhood. Yeah, wherever. Hey, oh, wow. hey, I gotta drive two miles. I gotta drive ten miles, but I looked in the system and seven houses are on the way. The ten miles. Wow. And let me. So let you me can make extra money doing that. You they can make that? extra. Yeah. That's pretty smart. I'd be picking up whole truckloads. And it home. wins for everybody, right? But when I look at a when I look at hmm. an entrepreneur like Jeff Bezos who does stuff like oh, that, I go, he's still scrappy. He's yeah. still thinking, you know what I mean? Got all this money in the bank, but he's still trying to still, maximize yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, he's still scrappy. Do you think the greatest entrepreneurs are more focused on money or on the mission? Look, I think without, without question, it's the mission. Okay, without question. And, and there's nothing wrong with the pursuit of money. I mean, it's perfectly fine. And it's, it's, um, it's the engine of capitalism and a, and a free market. Um, but, you know, at a certain point, what I've found with the people I've interviewed is that money is really, you know, at a certain point, there really isn't much more that it's going to, it's really not going to prove your life much more. You know, Stuart Butterfield, the founder of Slack, has a great, his great um, explanation for what it means to be wealthy. You can go to a restaurant, order anything you want. Um, you can basically go on vacation or wh wherever you want, and you, you're not worried about debt. And those three factors, basically, his argument is once those are taken care of, you are essentially wealthy. I mean, you are a, and, and there really isn't much else that's going to improve your, you know, your life or your anxiety or your feeling of security. And I, I think that most entrepreneurs, certainly the vast majority that I've interviewed, are 100,000% motivated by mission. I mean, he, here's, and here's actually the best piece of evidence for, for, for that. A lot of founders will eventually exit and sell their companies, right? And I think a lot of, a lot of people imagine that, okay, you, you have a company and then you sell it and then you've got $100 million and then you're going to go lie on a beach in the Caribbean and sip pina coladas all day, right? The reality is if you did that, you would eventually become very depressed. You would actually just begin to die, right, and wither. And most of the people I've interviewed, they want to work until the very end, until even, even when they have enough money for three generations behind them. Because it isn't about the money. It's about a sense of purpose. It's about mm -hmm. camaraderie. It's about community and a mission. You know, I, I mean, this, is, this might be weird for, for some of your viewers to, to, and listeners to, he, to hear, but I used to be a foreign correspondent. I covered the Iraq War. I covered the Afghan Wars. I covered Israel-Palestine. That's what I did before, you know, this is 15, 20 years ago. And I spent a lot of time in Iraq, 2003, 2004, 2005. And every time I would ask, you know, soldiers, what is it that, like, why are you here? Why'd you sign up for this? You know? And they'd say, oh, you know, to serve our country and blah, blah. I said, no, well, 
but why are you here? What, what is, what's keeping you here? Because you know this war is a problematic and mm-hmm. it can't just be about the flag. It can't just be about, because you know, part of you knows that what you do here isn't necessarily going to be reckoned. You know, people in the U.S. Are, 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 they don't even know what's going on here. What is it? And, and you get the same answer time and again. It's, it's to protect the guy on the left and on the guy mm-hmm. on the right. I'm here to make sure nobody shoots him and nobody shoots him. That's, that's, it's, it's about connection, camaraderie, mission, purpose. And it's the same thing with business. So you think what motivates people most is the connection of the idea or the product or the service uh, to the people you're working with or your customers or media? All of it. All yeah. of it. I think it's, it's like a Maslow's hierarchy, you know, all of it. And, and it's, it's the people you work around. I mean, how many times have you, have you encountered somebody who is very successful and then they left their job or they retired and then um, they don't have that daily interaction. They don't have, you know. What's happened in sports a lot where you're, yes. you know, as a former athlete, you, you see a lot of guys get depressed after they retire and they might have been an all-star, an all-pro bowler or whatever it may be, a Super Bowl champion, made $10 million contract, but then within a couple of years, they're very depressed. They're, they, they talk about missing the brotherhood or the, the locker room because of the camaraderie and the connection. And when you don't, when you have connection for so long and then you go in isolation, it becomes very lonely. Yeah. I I'm, I'm sure that's that I I'm, there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, just, I just watched that Michael Jordan documentary Mm -hmm. a couple months ago on ESPN. It's so, so beautiful. And, you know, seeing some of those um, old Chicago Bulls players, you know, the, the sort of the lesser knowns, not the Pippins and the Jordans, but the lesser knowns. And yeah, I mean, uh, you know, they're not, um, they're, no one's hounding them for autographs. They're not getting on planes. They're not, I mean, some of that I'm sure they don't miss, but some of it is, it's being part of a team, you know, being mm-hmm. part of uh, something bigger than yourself. Yeah. I'm curious, what do you think entrepreneurs are afraid of more, fear of failure or fear of success? I think that most of the people that I've interviewed, I, and I, I would take a, a sort of go on a limb and say most of us, I think are more afraid of failure, um, which is actually not, a good thing um, because failure is especially manageable failure is something we all have to experience and embrace. Um, I think that, that we all in our minds have this idea of what it means to be successful. And, and the reality is that success is not, it's not a, it's not an end point. You know, it's not like you do something and then you wake up and you say, you know, you, you blow the trumpet and say, da, 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 I'm successful and that's it. You know, it's like, and it's like exercise, you know, like I exercise every day. I, I don't love exercising every day. It's not that fun, but I can't just like my kids will say, daddy, you're, you're healthy. Why, why, why? You? I'm like, you can't just like get to a point and say, all right, I'm healthy. I'm done. Cause then you start to decline the next day. And I think it's a sort of a similar concept, which is, you know, success is a constant process and a constant journey. You know, I, I think by nature, most of us are more, oriented toward toward succeeding and and fe- and we most of us fear failure mm-hmm. um but of course it's th- that creates a, a whole other series of issues you know one of the things that i love about how i built this is uh, the people i talk to is and i've said this on the show i think failure is just infinitely more interesting than success mm. you know when uh, we get a lot of you know we you know you get a lot of pitches and i'm sure you get these two from 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 people who are like, hey, my client, um, they were the Forbes 20 under 20. They were this, 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 they were this, they were the Nobel Prize, you know, whatever, like all these accolades. And that's, that's great. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm totally down with that. But I want to learn from somebody who's like, here's where I screwed up. Mm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what a dumb idiot I was. <laughs> right. Because that's when we learn. And I think that, mm. and, and that's really where people are at their most generous when they're really kind of talking about their failures and it allows us to kind of get a window into their soul that we need to have to help us when we are struggling with, with failure. What would you say is your greatest failure then? Well, I'll start by saying almost every day being in this profession, there's some failure, right? Whether it's people not wanting to be on the show or or whatever. I mean, obviously now it's gotten much easier as I've grown, but you know, my, my dream, my real dream in life when I was a younger reporter 
was to be the main anchor, news anchor on NPR. Mm. I wanted to be the guy reading, t- telling the news on All Things Considered or Morning Edition, you know, because I thought that was important. Like when I came to NPR as a, you know, as a younger man when I was 22, uh, my parents didn't know what it was, you know, but I, I, I wanted, I think part of us, some of us are motivated by wanting to make our parents proud or whatever it might be. And um, so that was really what I thought I wanted to do. And I, I, I ticked all the boxes. You know, I was a foreign correspondent. I covered wars. I, I went to CNN and I was on, on television for two years covering Israel, Palestine. Um, I covered the Pentagon. I got you the- risked your life for this job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I got the weekend job. I, I did a fellowship at Harvard. You know, I ticked all the boxes. I did the, I was the weekend anchor for the news program, the weekend host. But um, I was so close. The weekend anchor. So close. So close. But I wasn't. I wasn't chosen. You know, and that was a real blow for me. That happened in in 2011, and I thought, you know, maybe maybe it was time for me to find a new career. I mean, maybe maybe I wasn't cut out for this. You know. Really. Yeah. I mean, look, it was very very hard because I really wanted that, and the reality is that in the news business, there are managers and programmers and executives and. They have their own vision, and, mm. and it's, it's a perfectly reasonable vision, um, and I wasn't part of that vision. And it was a time in my life where I, I really was trying to figure out what to do um, with it, and just very luckily, um, TED, as in the TED conference people, had approached NPR and wanted to collaborate on a show, and I, I heard about it, and I raised my hand, and I said, I'll do that. And so, I kind of left the news world in 2012, entirely mm. left it, and- that was a failure. And, you know, that was like, I mean, I still have emails from, you know, really prestigious colleagues in Washington, D.C. when I used to live there who were like, you're going to do a what? A podcast? What is that? Who listens to that? Wow. Why would you give up hosting the weekend news program? It's you're so, so close to the main, the main show. Yeah. Oh, so, so they would say, what? You have a massive audience. And we did. We had 3 million people listening on the weekends. On the radio now, that's changed a lot. Obviously, the radio audience has been in decline. But so I kind of, I was kind of in the wilderness in 2012. You know, I kind of went into exile, and I didn't really know if TED Radio Hour was going to be successful. I didn't know. And this was launching as a podcast. Yeah, yeah, because I started in January 2013, so you started in 2012. Uh, the the show the show launched in March of 2013. TED Radio. Well, it, okay. it, it was a relaunch of of the show, really. So it, it, it. so we launched about the same time in a space when, and this was before there was a million podcasts like there is now. I think we hit a million podcasts on Apple recently, and I think there was not even a hundred thousand shows or something, and it was. Yeah something that you couldn't even find. It was yeah. like you had to go to an app on iTunes. And <laughs> Plug in your phone. Yeah, it was, yeah. We, were, we were getting on when no one was listening, essentially. Yeah. Uh, there was a couple of that big people before us, so Joe Rogan's and some other tech podcasts, but it wasn't a big thing yet. Yeah. So you said, I'm going to leave NPR, the biggest show that there is in this space, and go – Launch this little podcast thing with Ted. Well, I mean, I launched it. I was launching it within NPR. So it was uh, okay, gotcha, a gotcha, collaboration. Gotcha. But I left the news side of NPR, which was uh-huh. the most important part of NPR. Right. It's and the thing that everyone know, knows about, listens to. And that's to. what everyone – and like if you're a journalist, that was what you wanted to do. You know, and, and it's I'm like going, the highest level of respect. The and highest level of respect. And it was Washington, D.C. And it's, you know, all these things. And here I am doing this podcast and like – you know, it's like the it's like the backwater of NPR at that time. You know, um, of course, now the tables have turned a little bit, but that that was really a, a, an enormous failure. But here's the thing: as with almost every failure I've had, it, it's happened for a reason. It's like a hidden blessing. Mm-hmm. It's like if that didn't happen, and I pursued that path, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know how happy I would be doing the news, especially. Today, I think the news is just, it's really hard. You know, it's a hard time in, 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 in our country. News is really important. I have a lot of respect and admiration for my colleagues who do that. But that failure really kind of saved me. One thing I realized is that at certain times in a man's life, he's either a fool, he's a victim, or he's a king. Mm. And when you're a fool, you're like, you goof it all up. 
you know, ah, oh, well, you know, it, it, but you, you think there are no consequences for your actions, but there are always consequences for every act you do, everything, good or bad. But then when you mess your whole life up, being a fool, you become a victim. Mm. Now, oh my God, look, you know what, it, you know why, you know why I did that? Because I was black. You know what? Because I, I, grew, I grew up in all that religion. And oh, my father was an alcoholic. You know, he beat my mom. You know that, right? Or uh, look at this. Look at the situation. I'm from Flint, Michigan, man. It's hard. It's hard for a black man in this, in this society. And this is the way we did it. I had. And let me tell you, the table is always full of excuses. Mm -hmm. Because they're valid. Yeah. There's a lot of people against you. And you can say, oh, my God, this table is full. It's like, man, you know, this is the reason why I'm like this. And this is this. this, this. And, and man, you never run out. And you always stay down. Always. You always. And, but the king stage is when you realize, wait a minute, this is your table. Mm. Wait a minute, this is your room. You have to accept whatever you are letting into your life, good or bad. As a king, you can tell people, get out of your court. Mm. As a king, you don't have to accept any of those excuses. Yeah. As a king, you have to know that you are responsible for your life, good and bad. You did that. So as a king, if something's not right, it's your responsibility to change it. Dude, it was like I had to go to rehab. I went to rehab. It was this place called Psychological Counseling Services. It was in Arizona. I mean, uh, in, um, yeah, in Arizona, in Phoenix. And man, how long did I, you go for? Oh man, well, we, we you go for a full. It's like an intensive. Yeah. Where you don't do anything. You're there for like 16 hours a day, and this is 2010. 2010. This was yeah, this was 2010. Yeah. So, and my wife told me she thought I would never ever do anything like that wow. because again, I was not. Listen, we have been going to like therapy, but when you're not honest, it doesn't work. You know what I mean? Like you're just telling the game and you know whatever. Dude, I went in there and I was like, this ain't me. This ain't me. And like the first couple hours, I'm like, come on. This is crazy. Then all of a sudden, I was like, oh my God, this is me. Wow. This is me. This is the problem. This is what I, this is the issue. And dude, I was in tears. Wow. I, was, I was broke. I was like, I was toxic. Like when you finally can turn the thing around and see yourself as ugly mm. as you were, I was just so, so guilty. Let me tell you, it wasn't shame. It was guilt. There's a big difference. What's the difference? Shame says you are bad. Guilt says you did something wrong. Mm. The problem is, when you, and I was feeling shame since I was a kid. Yeah. As you, as you, as you, as you. And this is the thing, when you are a shamed person, and when you try to motivate people through shame, what you're do, doing is constantly telling them, you are a bad person. You are like this. You are wrong. You are messed up. So you know what happens is, no matter where you go, you go back to, I am messed up. Mm -hmm. But when you realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not that I messed up. It's that I, I made a messed up choice. Yeah. That changed the framework for me. And I was like, and it didn't excuse anything. Now, mind you, it did not. It was, you are, I had to say it. And the thing is, it's like courtroom. It's like a court. For you to actually be guilty, you have to say it. Mm. Think about it. There's right. nobody, if you never admit guilt, it will never be presented. You have to say, I am guilty. Wow. I did the crime. And it allows everyone to see you as you truly are. And I went through the process of guilt, of, of making sure I was guilty. I knew what, I, I said, I put my wife through this. Mm. I put my family through this. I, I did this. I did this. Now let me correct it. Mm. But see, shame, you can't correct. Shame is incorrectable. You can't, there's nothing. What happens is shame, you just cover it. Shame is something yeah, yeah. you just put, you know, let's put some leaves over here. And, <laughs> let's put leaves over the body. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like there's no way you can really, yeah. you know, uh, shame is one of those things where you just have to, like, color it. Mm. Image, image covers shame. Mm. But when you are dealing with guilt now, you've been proven guilty. Now there's punishments. 
the, you have to make amends. Consequences, you have to yeah. do right. You have to be accountable. Um, there's all kind of things, man. You have to come back. You have to forgive people who did things to you. You have to ask forgiveness for what you did to other people. Let me tell you, it, and I have to say this: the forgiveness that my wife showed me mm. was a was what I say a car carrying lesson for any person ever because. And I understand why people get divorced. I do. I, first of all, I should be. Mm-hmm. But this woman, fine, uh, this is the thing, this is the intimacy that I always, always wanted because she saw me for who I was, for real. Mm. And she said, Terry, I love you anyway. Wow. Man, I th- wow. That's all you want. Yeah. That's all I ever wanted. All I ever wanted was to be seen mm-hmm. for who I was. And I was like, you love me? Like, I, I thought it was real. I was like, I thought she wouldn't come back. Mm. But she did. She said, but Terry, I love you. And man, that blew me away. Yeah. Because I was living this man life and uh, here I am. You see me as nothing. I'm like, I'm feeling about myself. Like, I feel like I'm worth dirt. And she was like, oh, I love you. Wow. And man, that changed everything. It was like, the thing that I needed, I was running from the whole time, Lewis. I was running from it the whole time. And I vowed, I said, after that, I said, my God, my God. I can correct this. This is mm-hmm. fixable. Mm-hmm. This is fixable. This is not something, and this is what I learned through through counseling, and I continue to, to this day. I mean, it's been 10 years wow. of constant, constant work. Constant, just, hey man, I can fix this. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. I don't think I'm the type of person that is brave enough to admit I've made a mistake, honestly, because I think things have not worked out along the way, mm-hmm. where things just didn't work out as I had hoped or dreamed them to be. And, but I don't see them as a mistake, because as quick as you're thinking, oh, poor me, you start to see the light of the door that it's opening that couldn't have opened without it, mm. okay? So I don't have like a regret yeah. of this was a big mistake or that was a big mistake. Uh, but I have to also say, I have my whole life been very cognizant of doing anything and exposing myself to anything, even when I didn't want to do it, because I'm deathly afraid of feeling like I would regret like, what if I don't do it? That's more of a motivation for me than yeah, doing. Me too. You know, yeah. just like, well, well, will I look back? Will I, will I, you know, like, for example, with Dancing with the Stars, I did not want to do it. I'm an old babe. The last thing I want to do is practice four hours a day. You were great. You, well, you think I was so great? Not the judges. They didn't <laughs> think so. I was the number one person on Dancing with the Stars last season. Number one rejected. Now, there's a record. Okay. But, so you might say that was a mistake with all the work that that led up to, and it was a social embarrassment. I thought I'd be rejected maybe number three or five or six, but number one, I never saw it coming. And so I was kind of a little mortified on that Mm. one. But you know what? I'm so thankful I did it, and the minute I recovered by the next morning, I'm like, thank God I did it, and thank God it's over. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Because I didn't want to, I said yes, because I didn't want to wonder what it would have been like, you know? So, what did you learn from the experience about yourself? I learned I'm not a good dancer. <laughs> I swear, I've looked at the tapes now one year later when I thought, I, same tapes I looked at a year ago, I thought, you know, I really got this. But I look at them one year later, I'm like, I'm stiff as a board. What was I thinking? <laughs> Missing steps. So, so what I learned from that is that I can't dance well. But inside my body, I feel like I'm a good dancer. And I'll get out on any dance floor and do my own makeup steps. And people really smile as I'm dancing because I don't really give a crap. Right. And I look like it, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but what did I learn? I learned that. Uh, the, I learned the same lesson I learned again and again, which is thank God I did it. Mm. Thank God. And, and the, the, the injury of, oh, God, you did so poorly, 
dissipates quickly, but there's an echo to not trying something that's gonna sting you, I think. Not, not that I know that, because I really don't do that, but I'm, I'm afraid of it. It's like, it's like fear of a nightmare that might happen. I don't know why, because I don't really have that in my life, but yeah. I'm fearful of it. Yeah, I think yeah. that'll sting you for a long time too, that yeah. fear of regret of like, oh, I had the opportunity to do this, dance with the stars, and I didn't do it. How many years would you think about not, yeah. you know, what Maybe a do? year, but still a bad yeah. year. You know, um, you know what uh, regret does, I think, and, I, and why I've been able to build up my personality and whatever I can get out of and give to life as best I could. Mm -hmm. um, what regret does is it quietly takes down your confidence a notch. Because in short, you're a coward. You shied yeah. away. Even wow. if the right decision is to shy away. Once you shy away, you quietly, without even consciously thinking, think a little less of yourself. Now, I say that from experience because I've watched many people get stronger or people where life makes them weaker. And there's a lot that goes into that. But I really believe that uh, that regret piece is not given um, enough due. You really have to try everything and try your best because even, and listen, two out of three things I try don't work out, you know, but people just remember the success, that's what I've learned. But I know what the failures are. But still, I got confidence out of failing each time. A little notch up, a little notch up. So then you conduct yourself with more power in life because wow. you feel better about yourself. And ironically, you have more to give. You're a better package to give more because you've you've put a lot into that basket by just trying, 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 trying. You know. Do you feel like yeah. you're more confident even though you're the first one out of Dancing with the Stars that you you, oh, you did it and you absolutely, went towards it you, yeah, absolutely, I'm more confident. I got a lot of confidence out of that wow. because every female friend and male friend I had that was even close to my age. They were like, I okay. can't believe you even went for it, right? They said, you're at, they would discourage you, you're out of your mind, da, 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 but I won all their respect, and they constantly say, that was amazing, that was amazing. So even my friends that kind of took me for granted think better of me. I went up a notch in their wow. head, you know? It takes a lot of courage to do that. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to publicly fail, but I happen to be very good at public failure. Really? Because I've done it my whole life, and I'm, that doesn't bother me. I think uh, what I think what I didn't want to happen was that I would look foolish or old dancing with a 24-year-old rip stud on the floor <laughs> until I realized it feels really good to lean in on that oh, guy and go. let him yeah. spin you around that floor. <laughs> and how many of my girlfriends were having to dance with anybody like that lately? There yeah. you go. That's a, good, that's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah. What would you say, um, why, did you not, why are you not afraid to fail publicly? Because you know what I've learned? Nobody's really watching. Nobody gives a shit. Yeah. Everybody's they so about it the next year or whatever. Well, yeah. no, maybe even in the moment, because the truth is <laughs> that people, most of all, are thinking about themselves. So just when you think the limelight's on you and everybody's going to say, "God, is she stupid? God, why would she say that or do that?" The minute they've given you that one moment of attention, they back on to their own problems, their own selves. So it's like overstatement of your ego to think you're mm. really that important. Right. You know, you could just move right on. We could distract people. You try the next thing, and their eyes on that if you're lucky. So no, it doesn't really amount to anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really amount to anything. Right. Yeah, it's self ego that is not really true. <laughs> That's interesting because you say that most people are focused on themselves. So when mm -hmm. you mess up publicly or you fail publicly, they'll think about it for a moment, but then they're on to their own thing. If you're lucky and they notice. If you're yeah. lucky and you notice. <laughs> most people won't notice. Yeah. It just feels like everyone notices. Yeah, right? definitely. It's what about, shame. Right. Exactly. Yeah. What about um, when you want people to have the attention on you for the things you're doing good. Mm. How do you keep uh, the attention on you, the relevancy of yourself as an entrepreneur or an individual when mm -hmm. people are focused on themselves so much? Mm -hmm. How do you keep them thinking about you, your brand, your business, your work, your mm -hmm. mission? You have to think of a way uh, to grandstand. You know, what do you mean by that? Uh, good old fashioned grandstanding. Like, I built my Corcoran Group brand on the backs of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post, without a doubt. I would think of all kinds of crap to get media attention, hmm. okay, as long as my brand name was in there. Really? The best, single best thing I thought of, uh, which was really just an attempt to get publicity when I couldn't afford advertising because it was a bad market, was my Corcoran report. And all that was is a, was a one-page report giving, giving the average sale price of apartments in Manhattan is how I labeled it. I, didn't, I was too stupid to know that that was a wrong label. It was just my 11 sales. 
but it was on the front page of the real estate section, really? and I was quoted on the first line. And boy, that was an eye-opener. That's how I learned that publicity can build a brand. Today's version of publicity that I look for in all of the entrepreneurs I invest in is how good are you at social media? I don't care if you're in the sock business, yeah. if you're in hardware, or what, what's going on, how good are you at social media, what's your following? Those are the key questions now. How, how well, how good are you at, at building uh, attention through social media because that's the new free ride not really free but to a large degree free just like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal my free ride okay so you have to be creative I think in thinking of how you can grandstand and so what's uh, like I don't know I'm thinking what's a business right today like well I don't want to use cousins we already talked about uh, cousins like um, um, Grace and Lakes, which is a, started out as a baby sock company. Phenomenal entrepreneurs I have. Is this the long, like the long? Lady stocking, yeah, yeah. with the little lace on top. I bought some of those for a girl before, yeah. And they make girls look sexy. They make them look great. And they're well priced and they're beautifully yeah, made. They're nice, they're elegant, yeah. they're sexy. Well, yeah. now it's a full fashion line and it's, uh, I think, $17 million in sales this year. Wow. But what are they particularly good at? There's, there's a husband and a wife team, Melissa, the the, the wife of the team has gorgeous long legs. You may remember her from Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. Her husband's more of a, a nuts and bolts guy, but great at business. What she does is she constantly models and talks directly to the camera. She has so many people that love her. She has limited edition. She sells out constantly, constantly. Wow. She's great at social media. She knows how to primp herself, right. look sexy, talk to the ladies, and get sales. Okay. So she uses her assets, her Asset, skills. Asset, yeah. but she does on social media, and that's built their entire business, social media. Wow. Yeah. And did I answer your question? Because I feel like I somehow got lost in my... How do you stay relevant when things oh. are going good? Mm -hmm. Because when, when your things are going bad, they'll look at you for a moment, maybe, mm -hmm. where it seems like everyone's looking at you, but then they forget. Mm -hmm. How do you stay relevant while you're growing or while things are kind of going the same. I'll give you another example. I have a company that I just bought in this past season. I was out of my mind to buy into them. It was two guys with a product called Comfy. It was a sweatshirt blanket. You slip into it, it's like a sweatshirt, but it's actually a blanket blanket. Why I say it was crazy to buy into it, none of the sharks, they were smart enough not to, is because they're two loudmouth guys having a good time, pitching their product, and they had no inventory. They had handmade their own product. Mm -hmm. Two prototypes, had no idea what it would cost to make, what they'd sell for, who they'd sell to. They had none of the answers, but they were great salesmen. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, ah, I'll take 15 or 40% whenever I got of it, boom. Just because they're great salespeople, mm -hmm. all right? And what they have done is they've done in their first year $11 million in sales. Wow. They found a way to produce it and sell it. But a couple of weeks ago, it was very quiet they have had social media coverage to the moon and back, but it was very quiet and they hand delivered, and I wish I could remember the famous actress name, sexy, cool, long-legged actress. I'm so bad with names. Whoever she was, <laughs> I think she was the same actress who closed the uh, Oscars the other night. I might be telling her. I didn't watch it. But ah, yeah. shame I on you, the, the my man. Videos, oh yeah. my God. I was on plane, oh, so. come on. Yeah. All right, well, anyway. I saw your little party, watch party on Instagram. Oh, so lonely, yeah. man. But anyway, <laughs> they sent hand-delivered to her front door how they found it in Hollywood, the package, mm. and she put on video her jumping on no her way. bed in it. They, quicker than a second, started a social media campaign, people competing with the jumps. They're Johnny on the spot. That's smart business, okay? Mm. They're causing attention. They made it happen, and then they're gonna write it again, and it's gonna be all over social media all over. Yeah. They're annoyed with me that I'm here because I don't have their product because they want me jumping on the beds. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put the hood on. I have one girlfriend that has gorgeous long legs. Go. I'm gonna Photoshop my head in to her <laughs> long legs, and I'm gonna win the contest. Perfect, I like that. <laughs> so grandstanding now is like more influencer marketing, if you can find creative yes, ways to that's find a fancy way to put it. With an audience, maybe it's a micro audience or, or, or a large audience. Or create an audience of yeah. your own one by one, but you really have to be able to grandstand. Yeah. yeah. I know you talk about uh, the keys to entrepreneurial success a lot, but for those who haven't mm -hmm. heard you talk about it, what are, what are you think some of the smart ideas in business right now? The smart industries to go into if someone's mm -hmm. maybe talented, maybe they sold a company or they're trying to start as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What's an industry you really like, a product uh, section you really like? Mm -hmm. 
you know, is software, is it coaching, is it mm -hmm. consulting, is it an agency, is it physical goods, what, food? What's the type of category you really think You know, is really none of the above, mm. okay? It's not my cup of tea to think of an industry that's, that you can, uh, there's certainly leading industries. I don't believe that's where your head should be if mm. you're thinking of going into business. I think your head should be is what do you enjoy? What are you naturally inclined to be good at? What were you always good at? Things, these, these abilities don't change much. Whatever mm. you're, you know, if you're gregarious as a young kid, you generally don't wind up as a bookworm, you know? <laughs> when you get older and get a head on your shoulders, you're still gregarious. So I think what you have to do is think, what would suit me? What could I visualize myself doing where I could picture a happy picture mm. of myself, you know? And I think most people are capable of dreaming that up. I don't think it's an analytical kind of left brain kind of thing where you apply yourself to your best shot, like going and playing back blackjack and putting your chips on the right thing. No, I think you have to figure out your the table, where should you put your chips? What mm. what's on you? What's true to you? Okay, and so. For me, it took me 22 jobs to find real estate, but the minute I was out opening keys, uh, you know, opening the doors and chatting people up and it didn't feel like work and I was the right. boss, I knew I was gonna be the queen of New York real estate. I knew it as sure as I knew my middle name was Anne. I just could see it in my mind's eye. I never had that vision when I worked my other 22 jobs. And the other thing, uh, it's sort of related to what you ask. I think it's such a, it's such, wrong thinking that you have to choose your spot. I think it's like finding out what clothing you look good in. You mm. gotta go try a lot of shit on the rack and see what works with you. And then you kinda, little by little, kinda get your look on what looks well with right. on your body type, your personality, the colors that are good. I think you find yourself little by little. It's very hard to sharpshoot. It's not that kind of a thing. Yeah. And you know, often the people, I know so many entrepreneurs well beyond or well before Shark Tank, peers of mine in many industries that have succeeded. No one ever went out for that industry. And so that's what I want to do. But you know what made the biggest difference in a myriad of those, if that's a word, a selection of those people, uh, that made the biggest difference was they came along someone they worked for who believed in them. Getting one good boss that gives you an opportunity is worth a million intellectual thoughts and Harvard MBAs grouped up in a pile. Because you kind of can sometimes need somebody else to see that light or you get into something you never thought you'd be interested in and you really love your job. And then that winds up being what you do for a lifetime. Yeah. And so I don't believe that you name the big industries. That's more of Mark Cuban stuff. He's mm -hmm. like high level um, investment strategy stuff. But I'll put my businesses against his any day, one to one. <laughs> and I because I think I'm so good at, at seeing who's got that talent mm -hmm. that matches where yeah. they are, you know? Yeah. If, uh, if someone's approaching you for uh, investment or to partner with you, mm -hmm. and you could choose only three qualities Mm -hmm. that you would dream that they would have. Mm -hmm. Whether that's, uh, you know, never giving up, a grit, a, a positive mm -hmm. energy, whatever the quality may be. Mm -hmm. And you could say, if they had these three qualities, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what business they're in, maybe timing and the, if, uh, the uh, economy might play a little bit of part here and there, but like if they had these three qualities, mm -hmm. they're most like, I would bet on them any day. Yeah, well that's what I do every day on Shark yeah. Tank. Yeah. yeah, And I've gotten better at it because I've learned to hone in on those. Um, I could think of two, maybe I'll come up with a third sure. if I keep talking. <laughs> All right, uh, number one is uh, salesmanship. Mm. I have never succeeded with any business uh, where the principal didn't know how to sell. Mm. I mean, sales is the guts of every business. If you don't have sales, you're not in business. Any business applies to everything, okay? So, okay, if you're a technology nerd and really are in a technology space, but you better have a partner who could sell the shit out of it right. or it ain't gonna go anywhere, okay? So selling is number one. The other uh, thing I look for, and maybe it sounds weird to you, but I've learned it to be a great, um, almost insurance policy. I look for injury. I look for anger in the individual. Mm. If I could find someone uh, and this is true of all my successful business, interestingly enough. If I could find someone who had injury at an early age and has something to prove, I got myself a winner. It's wow. like insurance, okay? So when I say injury, meaning they were dunce in school, like three out of four, three out of five sharks were dunces at school. They're, they're out to prove, you know? Um, I have 
I, I don't want to out them, so I, I sure, won't use. Sure. I'm inclined to use the names, but I won't. I have entrepreneurs usually successful, who never had a father, mm -hmm. and then when they went on Shark Tank, their father after 35 years was back into how insulting it enraged them. Okay, I have on, entrepreneurs who were sports figures, uh, almost. Uh, going to be professional sports people had an injury, but were fiercely competitive with someone who wound up in their space. They hate that person because <laughs> wow. they played against them in ice hockey. Crazy! All I have to do is name the other person; their sales go up. Wow! Yeah. So I think uh, anger and proving uh, is very much part of a lot of successful stories out there. It's an overcompensation, overproving, mm. overdriving. Like I'll show you. Give me the I show you something that went wrong earlier, and you've got a motivated person, and it gets you through hard times really well. And then um, I'm coming up with a third. I can't. There's a million other ones, but none of them as serious as that. Mm. Oh, it's those two. You have to be able to sell, and if you have injury. Uh, to prove something, it's a wonderful insurance policy. How important is a positive attitude with oh. those two things? Like well, if that's you were negative, a given. Oh, you don't, let me tell I'm you. Just, I don't know. You're just not even going to get out of the gate. Well, there's negative people. All right, you know what? You might be trying to prove people wrong and always nasty about it. You know, Forget it's like, it. Let me tell you what's true about a negative person. You won't meet them in the entrepreneurial space. You know why? Because they are far more comfortable criticizing the next guy than doing. Negative people are bloodsuckers. They just suck your energy away. You know, the nicest thing I did for all the people that worked with me over the years was get rid of negative people the minute I spotted them. I didn't care if I had cause. They were out. You know why? Because it's like it's like letting the enemy quietly into your camp and giving them free reign. Negative energy is the enemy of all business, especially I've always been in sales related businesses. You let a negative person into a sales force, they have a pity party, all of a sudden they need one more person to feel sorry for mm. them or to point out what's wrong. It's terrible. I would spot them a mile away, feel their vibe. Do you have a few minutes on Friday? I'd love to have a chat with you. Wow. <laughs> because I felt like I was saving my good people. Yeah. You know, they were good, positive people. I don't mean criticism, it's invaluable in business. You need to have your criticizers to let you know when you're off and what you could do better. But I'm just talking about regular bloodsuckers, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's you. met a few. I yeah. hear you, I yeah. hear you. Now, sales is number one for mm -hmm. you. If they were a great salesman, mm -hmm. you would bet on them. If they were a great salesman with something to prove, that's like the golden ticket, it sounds oh. like. So how does someone train to be a great salesman if, they've, if they don't know how to? Is it something they can learn? Or is it something you just have to uh, be a part of your energy? Well, you had question about positive. Uh, that's the blood that goes through a great salesman. Mm. Seeing the positive side of anything. And a lot of people see that as baloney. I don't. It's just like, you show me a negative and I'll say, you know, you're right, it's a negative. But I can tell you what the upside of that negative is. So you have a bend toward being positive. So you must have uh, that, okay, to be a salesman. If you don't, you'll never become a salesman. I don't care how hard you try. I think it's an intrinsic quality, a personality trait. I know you're not supposed to say that. Everybody's supposed mm. to believe you could become a salesman. I think if you're inclined to be outgoing and, mm -hmm. and positive, you can become a better salesperson. But the real phenomenal salespeople that I have worked with and I've made my living my whole life in different venues with phenomenal salespeople, I am telling you, um, they come out of the gate, maybe not out of the womb, but they come out of the adolescent gate right. as salespeople. It's very hard to teach that. It's a it's an artistic gift to be able to sell really well. Because think of how complicated it is. You have to read the situation accurately. You have to read the person and think of how you could use them in the way that they want to use themselves and thank you in a thank you note 12 hours later thinking it was their idea. That's a complicated little thing, right? right? right. And you need to think of how that person could be used for your long-term goal of the picture you want to create. So that's very complicated math in the head. And that's what great salespeople do. Why do so many people make money the enemy? You know, first of all, like I, I think I, I think about that all the time. I think as we grow up, a lot of the movies we watch as a kid, it's like the guy with the money on the hill was the villain, mm. right? Yeah. And I, I was on a I was on a boat with Richard Branson. Um, on the only reason it's not because I'm really cool, it's because <laughs> I helped raise a million dollars for his charity, uh -huh. and for that, for Virgin United, he invited me down to his island. 
and he saw that I got up at five. He got up at five. So he said, hey, tomorrow when you get up, let's, uh, let's uh, sail. He's like, you know how to sail? I'm like, oh, yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> He's like, grab the F-line. I'm, like, I'm sorry, dude. I, I don't know. Just tell me what to do. Yeah. But one thing he said, and it helped me a lot with money, he, I said, uh, I feel like I should be giving back more. And I said, he said, you said that or you I said, said that to him. And I said, should I, should I um, you know, donate more of my time? He said, well, the way I look at it is different. You were given a gift to know how to generate revenue. He said, and this is something that I'm paraphrasing, but this I'll remember it forever. And it really shifted my mindset on money. He said, you could go to a charity or you go to a soup kitchen and you could work there for three days and that'd be wonderful. I, need, I know they need help. Or you could swing by there one day and drop off a check for 50 grand. The second one, that's what you're, you were given that gift. Go yeah. make the 50. He goes, I was given a gift to know how to start and run companies. Now at this phase of my life, I'm giving most of it all away, but that's my gift. And it kind of made me realize is like, t I took the, the brakes off or took the brakes off. It's like, make as much as I want. I can give it all away. I can, you know, we just got done feeding 5 million. We just passed 5 million meals provided through yeah. Feeding America. We got all kinds of chairs. Like I, now I have this like no limits, like, cause money has allowed me to retire my parents. My money's allowed me to make it so my kids don't have to worry about their future, not raise entitled brats, but I don't have to worry about their future. Yeah. I get to be in better <clears throat> shape. If my fiance needs something, my mom needs something, my dad needs something, I can cut a check for those problems. And I can help with charity. So for me, it's like there's no limit. I want to just yeah. keep impacting lives and making money. How can people shift the perspective of money is this bad thing? What's the quickest way for them to, if they've been conditioned with a belief for decades yeah. that money is the evil or the money doesn't solve your problems or yeah. how do they, how do has someone, what's a perspective shift for people to understand like this really? Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the things I think, because I've asked this question on stage to tens of thousands of people through the years, and then I ask them to raise their hand if it's this. And one mm -hmm. that I never thought of was people feel in this, like, it, like intuitively somehow, that if they're making money, they're actually taking it away from someone else. Wow. And that's a, like, I don't know if any, like, and huh. as I say that somebody, right, you know, so many people right now are going, wow, I feel that way. Like if I'm getting wealthy, I'm hurting someone else. Or if I'm getting wealthy, oh my God, there's so many people starving in different third world countries. And it's the fact of the matter is there's always the same amount of money in the world. Money is either flowing away from you or money's flowing towards you. And I just want to position myself in a place where money's flowing towards me. And then I have the ability to give it away. Cause if you really think about this, when you make money, I would bet the majority of the world, not someone selfish, which is a rare thing, and I doubt someone really selfish would be listening to you, Lewis, is when you make money, what do you do? You end up hiring someone to do your lawn because you're making money. You mm -hmm. can do that. You, you send out your dry cleaning. You go out to dinner more. You buy a bigger house. You buy more furniture. And when you make money, you actually flourish the economy in your home, and then you flourish the economy around you. So like, I just have this philosophy of like, I, if I want to help the economy, if I want to help the environment, if I want to help the people I love, I make money and I get to help the economy, help mm -hmm. the environment, help the people that need it. <clears throat> yeah. And I just change that belief because again, if you make money to, you know, sell drugs, or if you make money to promote gambling, like that's evil, that's bad. It's really just the byproduct. And in most cases, uh, more money, the byproduct of more money is in positive impact. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. why is America, you know, such a lead in finding cures in finding technology? Because a lot of the companies and money flow here to solve those problems. Yeah. But America is also the biggest uh, contributor to charities around the world. I mean, mm -hmm. look what Bill Gates did. So I, I just found a way and I'd encourage everybody listening, find a way to just change that. It, whatever story you're telling yourself, it's most likely a lie. It's a story that someone else gave you. We know all this. Mm -hmm. I'm not sharing anything you don't know, but just prove that it's wrong. Go find wealthy people who've made a massive impact. Yeah. Because I, the last thing I'll say about money, I know we didn't plan on getting this, but I, I feel like we have a dysfunctional relationship with money. Like if you're the therapist, you know, the therapist is sitting a third party over here, like where your candle is and you're money and I'm the patient. It's like, I think we're saying like if they're looking at us like a relationship, you're saying mm. money, I don't like you. I think you're evil. I think you're wrong. But simultaneously, I'm always stressed about money and I want more of it and I want to be able to help people. And I want like, and I feel like I never have enough and I never have enough. Right. So it's like, it's the push and pull. It's like yeah. a, it's like a dysfunctional relationship. And I think if you have any hesitation around money, it's time to fix that relationship. Wow. And then, you know, I've had people write down five things they would do when they made more money and five problems that more money would solve. 
And most of the time people write, I'd make sure my mom was okay. I would take care of my health. And none of them on the list is buy the Lambo, the new watch and be, uh, you know, selfish or, (laughs) or buy, you know, have more carbon emission. Like nobody writes in negativity. They write all impactful Uh stuff for other people. And the last thing I'll say is this, and I've been using this analogy for myself for years, Lewis, is I look at when you first get on a plane, you know how they say if the oxygen mask drop, put yours on first Mm -hmm. and then help if you have a child with you, right? I look at that with money is when I put my oxygen mask on, when I'm secure, when, if you're listening right now, if you get confidence, if you have control of your life, if you have financial security, as soon as you feel stable, I, what happens every single time is you start putting oxygen masks on. Mm. When I was 26, I retired my mom. When I was 33, I retired my dad. Both of them worked their butts off to make nothing. I put oxygen masks on my mom and my, my dad. I helped my nephews go to college. I paid off debt for people that I cared about that it was it was crippling them with stress. I was able to help my mm-hmm. stepdad when he needed a surgery and they needed 40,000 bucks immediately. I was a- like so I just realized if I get secure and I obsess on making it, I don't have to hold it and hoard it and be this bad human. Mm-hmm. I can be a human that solves problems, puts oxygen masks on other people. That's powerful. We were talking about um briefly we were talking about this that it seems like there's a common denominator for every millionaire or successful person that we know Mm -hmm. that they always had something dark happen or multiple dark things happen and something that drives them, whether it's the greatest athletes in the world, the biggest, you know, billionaires in the world, there was something that defined them early on or some things that defined them. I'm curious, what were the three moments when you were a kid that really defined you to be this driven, hungry person to originally like just be make sure that money wasn't an issue yeah, really great and, and want to continue to grow and, and, you know, reach a billion dollars in sales and all your businesses yeah. and impact the world because that doesn't happen just if you have a happy, normal life. Yeah. In my opinion. And you know what? No, really great question, Lewis. And, and here's what happens over time. Some of that goes away. Yes. And you craft a new story. Of course. I did it because I wanted to change the world. I'd lie if I said that was true. But there's usually <laughs> <Bullshit>. <laughs> some, there's some defining moments that yeah, usually there happen is. when you're so 5, I, 10, 7, whatever. I, I know some of them. One is um, my mom did work. And this sounds like a, an infomercial <clears throat> story. My mom worked three jobs. Mm-hmm. She, was, she was a hairstylist. She cleaned houses and then uh, cleaned up after a painter. Yep. Right? And she did those three jobs. And I asked her to this day. She made about $90 a week. Because she didn't, she barely got out of high school. She had dyslexia that wasn't diagnosed. And my mom's a beautiful woman inside and out. Mm-hmm. Unbelievably gorgeous. Heart, soul, all of it. But she always felt dumb. Like she yeah. she failed every grade. She quit school in 11th grade because she was so embarrassed to go. And uh, so she kept that mm. stigma inside. And I remember being really young and watching her come home from work tired as hell at seven o'clock my parents split when i was three so we were living in a trailer park I, my fiance's here i took her to the trailer park that i was wow. living in and we'd come home latchkey kids when we were like six and eight because you know my grandma would come a lot my grandmother was amazing yeah. so she was there a lot too so we weren't so you were, you were just with your mom your yeah. dad was your dad in the picture or uh no? every other weekend okay you saw him but yeah, it wasn't, saw yeah and <clears throat> just watching her i can remember lucy i I don't want to exaggerate, but I, I can. I moved in with my dad when I was twelve. I think I look back at that. I was like seven or eight, and I remember saying, "I'm. There's no way I'm letting this happen to my mom. I am doing this." Wow. My mom was my original. Like, I'm taking care of her. There's no way I'm letting her work this hard. And it, it, it broke my heart. Like, if I look back, my heart was broken all the time watching her come home, and she wouldn't complain, but she was just tired. You know, so one, I remember thinking I'm getting wealthy to solve that problem. I mean, young, young, At seven, eight, nine yeah, seven, years eight old. years old. I mean, I had an uncle Larry who was very, uh, um, he went to college, all his, his kids went to college and I just didn't, I mean, from nine years old, 10 years old, that's just the path I, I knew I wasn't going to college. I really? didn't think I was that smart. My family didn't have money. I'm like, I'm just, I'm going, I just wanted money out of the way. Like it wasn't like. Today's world has changed a little bit with social media, right? There was no such thing as the internet when I was mm-hmm. that age, right? This is 40 something years ago, right? And I think money has gotten a bad rep a little bit more because I didn't look at, I didn't have like 
guys, you know, photos flashing of the everything. Money. Yeah, like driving the Lambo or in the in the <clears throat> private yeah. jet or you know the look at me and the, the Rolexes, the champagne, yeah. so the champagne pop in the nightclubs. I didn't know that. I didn't even know that world existed, Louis. I, I we didn't have money. I lived in a blue collar town. Nobody I knew had money, so mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was saying I'm getting rich because I want to roll. You just wanted like, to help your mom I wanted stop my suffering. Mom not yeah. suffer. And man, that that's him. And the one thing I love telling people, and again, I, you may have heard this, but maybe today is the first time you actually hear it. It's okay to be in pain over something. Just don't ignore it. The the biggest plight we do, all do to ourselves, I think the biggest uh, like negativity we do to ourselves is we avoid the things that bother us. When I say what I believe is let that pain sink in. If you if you get moving to start your own business, to scale the company you have, to finally quit the job that's dry, you know, draining you, if it's because of pain, use it. Like so many times when people listen to you and all the amazing people you've brought to, to the world, Lewis, I love what you do, man. I mean it. I'm Thank I'm really you. proud to be your friend. Thank you. I love watching what you do. I love watching you grow. So many times we'll get into personal growth and we start thinking compelling future. I got to look ahead. I got to stay positive. I got to be the man. I got to be this woman that keeps it in control and everything is good. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm happy. I'm alive. Like sometimes that's just bullshit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes life sucks. And what I realized, what moved me as a kid had nothing to do with a compelling future. It had nothing to do with aspirational quotes. It had nothing to do with meditation. It had to do with, I hated where the freak my life was. I hated watching my mom and I was fixing that shit. And it bugged me every day. Like it bugged me. And Until you were like 16, 18. Yeah. That was, and like I was, I was hustling. I, I. 13, 14 years old, I used to go around the neighborhood and clean out people's garages. And then I'd take all that and I'd do a massive garage sale. Wow, that's cool. So 13, and my gram was the, the bomb. My gram would drive around, have her trunk up. I'd clean out the garages. It mostly was her friends, right? right? right, right. So I'd clean up like, oh, that's garbage, that's garbage, that's garbage. I'd be like, you want to sell that? Like, oh, I can't give that away. Like, I'll sell it, I'll give you half. Like, okay, this is before eBay. It didn't exist. That was mm -hmm. eBay on my gram's front yard, right? So she lived a little bit off the highway. I'd put a sign, yard sale. Man, I'd be out there on Saturdays wow. learning how to sell. Because people had no mercy. I, I was a young kid doing yes. it. They'd still come five bucks, I'll give you two. It's like, oh, <laughs> make it four, you know? So yeah. I was negotiating that. And then at 16, I started a firewood company. I, a firewood company. I, I cut trees down, split it, stacked it in the back of a truck, and delivered yeah. it for $90 a wow. quart. Um, are, you ch are you chopping it with the uh, Chainsaw and chain a log splitter. And, wow. Yeah. Not manual. Like no, 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 no. No, it wasn't, uh, what do they call it? Like, yeah, the, Just yeah. an axe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the axe. I wasn't big enough yeah, for exactly. that. Yeah, um, exactly. So... That one motivator was my mom, okay. for sure. So that was the first yep. thing. What was the second thing, moment or defining experience? Um, I didn't have money in school. It was like when I moved in with my dad, I was 12 years old. My dad, um, the my dad's uh, my dad was the youngest of 12, uh -huh. and was physically and sexually abused his whole childhood. Yeah. And back in those days, there was no therapy, talk therapy, nobody, not going Nothing. to a counselor. Just suck it up. Have yeah. the ability to talk like you and I talked when we were jogging. Yeah. Yeah. Men back then didn't talk. My dad's 83 now. He didn't, he wouldn't go to his best bud. Oh my God. You know, when I was five years old or seven, I was molested by my cousin. No one knew. In the old days, they'd be like, get away from, you know. Yeah. Um, so he didn't talk about it. So what he had, he had this built up anger his whole life and no one was able to take advantage of him. Like if, if, you know, the waiter was rude to him. He'd be fist fighting on the floor with Crazy. the waiter, right? If, if we were in, we were driving in traffic one day and, and the, the flag guy during construction, he didn't wave to my dad. He was like looking at somebody else. My dad drove by and he goes, Hey asshole, didn't you see me? And my dad literally jumped out and just beat him. Oh my like, gosh. Like that's, that was my dad road. Like he was just, he was infuriated with everybody because he was this young kid who got abused and no one was there to protect him and nobody was doing that now. So he lived with that and, and he's in an amazing place right now and I love him dearly. But when I was 12, 11, it was so bad that I was, I was afraid. I was just afraid. Like I, I was nervous for him and I wanted to help him. So at 11, I left my mom and moved in with him. Mm -hmm. And when I moved in with him, I legit, this is again, sounds like some infomercial story. I, I moved in the bat. He I literally had a house with no heat because he was remodeling and he ran out of money. And he was working on it. So we had to literally drag a bed into a bathroom at night and plug in a little electric heater. Mm. And that wasn't forever, but it was for yeah. months. Um, and when I moved in with him, uh, it wasn't poor me. I didn't know anything different. It was fine. And I learned a lot by living with my dad, and the good, the bad. I learned how to negotiate and all those things. But some days I'd go to school without lunch money. And there was a point, and this is okay too. I'm not 
anywhere near that now, but there was a point where when I saw people with money or like when everybody turns 16, a lot of kids in school, their Had parents cars. got them a new car. Yeah. And, I remember, and they, money. they had the yeah. new girl, the, the car, and then they'd get the cheerleader. And I'm the guy going home every day working with my dad. I worked every single day. I worked on cars. I worked on construction. And like, I remember being like, you know what? You, you can't hear me now, but you'll hear me someday. Wow. In my, in my high school, high school yearbook, <laughs> literally my quote is like, I might be silent now, but someday like it, it'd be impossible not to hear me. Like I got to get the quote. I just found my yearbook. Damn it, it's old. <laughs> it's from 1986. Like, oh wow. my God. Um, but anyway, I want to read the quote, but it was something like, you don't hear me now, but someday you'll hear me roar. Wow. And that's, I, I had this like internal chip. Like I was really shy, polite to everybody. I called every one of my parents' friend, Mr. or Mrs. I still mm -hmm. do when I see them. Like I just, that's like, I wasn't like, yo, I got this. It was more like, oh yes. And I, I probably looked <laughs> really... Um, like not weak. I don't even know the word. Like just really like uh, an introvert and shy and like ah uh, he's. But I was hungry with a chip on my shoulder on the inside. Like you don't hear me now. You got the car. You got the girl. I got you. Like mm -hmm. and so that was probably another one too. Is sure, envy sure. and and I say mm. like envy is toxic. It's completely toxic, but it's, it's a, a driver. Good, it's a good driver, yeah. right? Like, yeah. just just think, like, you can't putt with a driver, but it's okay to smash a ball <laughs> off the tee, right? Yeah. So if you need envy to smash the ball off the tee, then use it. Like, again, I... Use it to get you going. Yeah, like, I, again, I, personal growth is my life. I mean, I'll tell that story in a little bit, but... Um, Personal growth is my life and 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 self-education. Tony Robbins, who's now one of my best friends in the world, he changed my life when I was in my mid-20s when I audited his course. Like, I was already financially successful. Yep. I already had a car business, a, a collision shop, an auto sales. I had wow. 21 apartments. At 26? At, at 24. 20, 24. Yeah, 24. I had 21 apartments. I had, a to, I had two tow trucks. I had a tow truck company. I was doing, I had Enterprise and Hertz rental car account. And how'd you um, have the money to I'll, fund all these things? Yeah, I'll tell you that in a minute. Um, so I got to that. Um, but up until that point, I was suffering to get there, like working night and day, stressing all night. Now you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, of man. Course. When you're starting, yeah, yeah. when you were on your sister's couch and you're thinking of going, all of a sudden you, get you don't going, stop, you don't stop. And then you're up at two o'clock in the morning solving problems. And you think that's the way you do. It. I got a competitive edge cause I can stay up all night. I can stress more than then anybody. You get, I can you get worry. Yeah. Gets, yeah. <laughs> get, I worry more than anybody else. So up until that point, I, I was on my way to already at a millionaire, um, from where I was a kid, but I was doing it through suffering. And, uh, you know, I gave Tony Robbins money off an infomercial. That's the reason I went in the infomercial business. Wow. I gave him a check. He gave me information. Everybody told me I was nuts. Like, you bought something off of some huckster on TV, which people probably have said about me in the uh -huh. past. I bought it. I went through it. I, get, I thought I was going to listen to it over like a month. And I just obsessed over like seven days. I digested every piece. And it was just so profound. No one I had ever talked to, and this is a true story, no one I had ever talked to in my entire life talked this way. Talked about people this way, about obstacles this way, about challenges this way, about your past. Belief systems, and, yeah. and belief system and limiting beliefs. And you and your past is designed for you to make you strong. And you know what? I just believed him. Like I didn't question anything because I saw my dad worked hard, but he wasn't rich and he suffered every day. And if I take on my dad's thoughts, I get to work hard and suffer. If I listen to this guy, it just seemed like a different path. And then he introduced me to Wayne Dyer and Eckhart Tolle and John Wooden and all these other people. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, <laughs> life, you know, self-education exploded. Um, but let me go back to your original question. One was my mom. Two was envy. Mm -hmm. I would say um, the third the third thing was probably um, and completely wanting control of my life. Mm -hmm. Like... I, I know I said that and there's probably another one I'm trying, I'm hoping something else comes to me, but I know for a fact what drove me more than anything was I hated not being in control mm -hmm. and I, I love my parents, but I just felt like they made bad decision after bad decision. I didn't want to listen to them on where I lived. I got my own apartment when I was in 12th grade. Like I didn't, I didn't like their decisions and I figured if I got money, 
no one can tell me how to live. No one can tell me what to do, how to talk. And the you truth is, I still need, feel yeah. that way. Yeah. Like, I, I don't want anybody to tell me when I can go no. pick up my kids from school or take them on vacation. I coach Little League. I coach softball today. I scheduled this with you at 1. I'm going to jump on a plane because at <laughs> 6.30 is my daughter's, my son's game. And at 7.45 is my daughter's softball yeah. game. I'm not missing either one of them. And there's nothing or no one that could tell me no, I'm not yeah. going to be there, right? That's just an exaggeration of what my life is. But there was a point where money will allow me to make, you know, be in control of my decisions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I still believe that. Yeah. I still believe that. What feels better for you, craving or curiosity? If you're curious about something. What feels better? Yeah, in your body. If you're even curious about this question. Curiosity feels better because craving feels like you're a, a slave to something. Yes. It's like you're a prisoner to this craving. I need it now. I'll do whatever I take to fulfill this emptiness yes. that I need to fulfill. <laughs> give me the M&Ms, give me the ice cream. I want the pizza now. Postmates, let's go, yeah. right? Uber Eats, DoorDash, I'm in. Right, right, and we can, we can have food instantaneously, Instantly. almost, now. show up at our door, yeah, right? And exactly. so we can reinforce those habits. The curiosity feels better because uh, you're exploring a different part of your brain, you're you're interested in something different. You're like wondering what could it, something else be like. But even that momentary experience, you used a, with your hand, you clenched your hand. Yes. So there's this contracted, closed down quality to a craving. Does yes. curiosity feel contracted or closed expansive. down? expansive. Yes. What's the possibility? Yes. So which, if you just took closed versus open or contracted versus expanded, which mm. one feels better? Expanded. Yes. Yeah. So right there, we can give our brain a very clear, bigger, better offer, mm. expand it. So for example, when we're caught up in ego and we're waiting for that next compliment, does it feel closed or open? Closed. Yes. How about when you're in flow? Like when you're just totally killing it in sport or playing music or having a great conversation, feel closed or open? Open. Yes. Bigger, better offer. Boom. Okay. So you reflect on the bigger, better offer of uh, feeling expansive, feeling healthier, happier, more fulfilled. Well, it's not even on what could be. It's right in that moment, moment. we can tap into that Got superpower it. of curiosity. What would the curiosity be? What, what is, as opposed to the craving, what are you curious about? We can get curious about the craving. Oh, what does this craving feel like in my body? And we flip the valence from this closed down feeling of craving being caught up in a craving to, oh, wow, this feels like tightness or tension or, you know, I'm feeling my hand move to my phone to click on, you know, click on the food eating app or whatever. Mm. Oh, wow, wow, wow. And we can just explore our experience in that moment. So we can actually hack craving with curiosity mm. just by bringing it in. Okay. And what if the craving is still there? Then we can get curious about that. Hmm, how long is this going to last? Is it changing? Is it moving in my body. We actually have had people on our program saying, you know, I had a, actually I had a guy walk into my office. I was working at the VA hospital and he walked into my office and he said, doc, I feel like my head's going to explode if I don't smoke. And you know, I was young, addiction psychiatrist. I was like, oh, what do I do? So I was like, well, uh, if your head explodes, just put the pieces back together and call me. I was like, <laughs> and he politely laughed, you know, it was like bad joke. But we actually got up and mapped out what head exploding felt like for him. What does it feel like? So he described it as like tightness or heat or um, clenching and things like this. And we mapped it out on my, I remember mapping this out with it on my whiteboard where we watched that wave go up and then over. So typically what somebody does is they'll smoke to make it go away. But he realized it goes up and it actually goes away on its own. And that was a big aha for him. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I feel like everything comes back to mindfulness and meditation. It's like the, the, to solve anything in life is mindfulness and meditation. It's what it all seems like it comes back down to over the last few years. I've done so, I've done so much research on meditation myself. I've been to India and re retreats, yeah. headspace, calm, had all the meditation teachers on. And it feels like it's the solution to so many things. Is that true? Well, I would say, especially for habits, uh, we can see how mindfulness helps teach us that awareness piece that can help our brains get that updated and accurate information. Yeah. So there's actually a pretty good scientific basis around mindfulness helping us with habits. Okay. So, and those habits can extend beyond eating and anxiety and smoking. 
they can extend to um, getting caught up in, you know, in ego, as we talked about thinking. a little bit. Yeah, yeah thank you. They can also extend to being attached to certain views, right? So if there are political parties where one side says, I'm right, and the other part side says they're right, and they just spend all their time fighting, how are we going to do anything? So what does fighting feel like, closed or open? Closed. How does it feel when people actually collaborate and cross the aisle and say, hey, I want to understand your point of view. I really want to understand it so we can work together. Open. Feels pretty darn Expansive, good. yeah. Yeah. So we can even see how mindfulness can help with these things where you know, people are, are not having a good relationship or, or societies are fighting with each other. We can stop, notice how unrewarding the fighting is and how rewarding it is just to remember each other's humanity. Yeah. What is the likeliness then of changing a negative habit without the use of mindfulness meditation? Well, the, the Rescorla-Wagner curve suggests that you really have to get that updated information to devalue the old things. So th there isn't anything else scientifically suggesting that we can change things. It's, you know, it's not about willpower. It's not about magical thinking. You know, it's not it, positive thinking and hoping and wishing. Hoping and wishing doesn't fit into the math. The only research says meditation, mindfulness, awareness, however it looks for you, that type of awareness is the only solution. That's what the math is suggesting. So mindfulness helps teach us to be aware and awareness is what helps our brain get, get that updated and accurate When we have a bigger, better offer. Yeah. Well, that, so the bigger, better offer can come in the form of curiosity or connection or kindness, yes. which or are often health. taught, taught, yeah, those are often taught as part of, of part of mindfulness practices, but even feeling physically healthy, mentally healthy feels good. And so that's going to reinforce those, ha those positive habits. So eating healthily feels better than eating a bunch of junk food. I certainly know this myself. Yeah. Um, so when we can really clearly see that cause and effect relationship, it's just much easier to stay on a healthy habit. What is, what is the root of addiction in your mind? You know, I like this really simple definition of addiction, continued use despite adverse consequences. So I would say the root of addiction, because that, you know, ad, continued use despite adverse consequences can be anything from self, being addicted to social media to a point of view. Um, so the, I think the root actually comes in this survival mechanism that's just trying to help us remember where food is. But in modern day, when food is plentiful, you know, most of us have a refrigerator yeah. <laughs> and, right. and restaurants are open, 20, you, know, you can find <laughs> yeah. a restaurant open any time yeah. of day. Um, that mechanism, that survival mechanism, mechanism is still in place. So I think that the root of addiction is actually, I, you know, paradoxically, there is a survival mechanism. Yet, in modern day, we refine, you know, coca leaves into cocaine. Um, we make we make synthetic opioids so that we can pop pills. Um, we we go on Instagram to look at cute pictures of puppies when we're bored. You know, right, all these right, different right. things that are and food is literally engineered to be addictive now. So that process, that natural survival process, get, has gotten hijacked. Mm -hmm. What is the amount of time it takes to break an addiction that's 10, 20, 30 years old? Is it possible to break it in a moment, a day? Does it take 30 days to break the habit or start a habit? What is the scientific research saying? Is it the longer you've been doing something, the longer it takes to break, or you can still break it in 10 days once you hit that rhythm? Yeah, yeah, it really depends. I'm remembering a guy that came into one of our early studies uh, who was smoking 30 cigarettes a day. And we started with the pay attention when you smoke, see what you get from it. Two days later, he came back and he'd cut 20 cigarettes. And he realized, you know, I get up and I drink coffee and I don't like the bitter taste of coffee, so I smoke a cigarette to cover the taste. Oh, I could just brush my teeth instead. So, you know, so for some people, you know, really clearly mapping it out and seeing how unrewarding the old behavior is helps them change a lot of the habits Quick. pretty quickly. Okay. So, and as I mentioned in some of our uh, now preliminary research, we're seeing with using these mindfulness apps like the Eat Right Now app or the Craving to Quit app that I mentioned, uh, we're seeing after people are using these, um, these craving tools about, you know, 10 to 15 times that significantly changes really? the value of that reward, right? 10 to 15 times, or is that 
10 yeah. 15 days what it's, is that like it that? really so depends on what the behavior is so somebody could have their um, their ice cream craving and so they can't just like eat ice cream 15 times in one day and do the thing and have it, I mean, sure, they probably sure. feel pretty sick and yeah, so it yeah. might help. Um, but it really has to come as part of their natural experience. So, so when you, you have the, the, when the craving comes up and you're about to do the addiction, you open up the app, mm -hmm. there's a, a guided meditation, there's a, some steps. The apps actually start with helping people map out their habit loops. And so this is some of my, uh, you know, well, I, I learned the most when I fall on my face. Yeah, we all do. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so when I was first starting this research, I had this hypothesis that it would be, you know, these formal meditation practices that would help people change their behavior. You know, I'd been meditating for a while. I'd gone on long retreats and, you know, would, would sit and meditate for a long time. I was like, this is it. It was great for me. But it turns out when we looked at our data that these informal practices, these in the moment um, practices where people were paying attention as they were smoking or paying attention as they were eating, where that's what was really helping to change the behavior itself. In the moment, not before the moment, when you wake up in the morning, at night, in the moment. Right, so the formal meditation practices can certainly be helpful, but we actually start by helping people map these things out. Because I didn't know, you know, when I first started learning to meditate, it was like, pay attention to your breath, and when your mind wanders, bring it back. I was like, okay, this makes sense. But when I went on, you know, I went on my first meditation, seven day silent meditation retreat, mm -hmm. by like day three, I was crying uncontrollably on the shoulder of the retreat manager. Because I couldn't pay, I was like, I made it through college, I made it in medical school, and now I'm I can't pay attention. Now I can't pay attention. So I thought I was a failure. And it turns out it's not about forcing ourselves to pay attention, right? The, the grit, the willpower doesn't, it certainly didn't work for me. It's really about understanding our mind. I want you to imagine the greatest version of yourself standing right in front of you. Mm. And in that moment, I'd actually never heard the way he told it before. Then I was like, wow, I could see myself mm. like with 100% confidence, calm, poised, like, mm the best looking version of myself, whatever, just like standing perfectly, not slouched, just every part of me, the best version. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I can push myself to be a greater person mm -hmm. by seeing it first and then taking the action steps to becoming that. Yeah. So I was like, that was a nice little... As long as you build in, <laughs> build in this kind of subclause uh -huh. that... Because like people can set these kind of goals that last forever. Joseph mm -hmm. Campbell, I'm sure, you know, yeah, big yeah. writer on myth said, you know, you can mm -hmm. spend your life climbing a ladder and then realize you had the ladder against the wrong wall. You know, there's, there's like, so there's, it's, I mean, it's why wonderful. Are we like, doing, why are we climbing the ladder, right? Yeah. Like, why well, are we climbing this or? Yeah, we, well, we, yeah, we spend a lot of time focusing on stuff like this. We have this image of this version of ourselves that we're moving towards and it's always out there somewhere. And it's kind of like all those things that like, well, that look, it's helpful. Like if you're gonna have a self image, of course, why not have a great self image? Mm -hmm. Cause we tend to make terrible ones, but yeah. it's just an image. It's just a picture in the head. It might as well be a good one. Yeah. But uh, in the meantime, there's also like the here and now, and there's like mm, making being present. Your, yeah, your relationship to the, to the parts of you that aren't right is, or, or don't feel right and making peace with that and understanding that in a different way. Like, you know, if you're in a relationship and, uh, I heard this as a philosopher in England called Alain de Botton. I really love this. He said, like, if you go to sleep, if you go to bed twice a week with your partner and you're thinking, what am I doing with this person? This is terrible. That's normal. Right? That, <laughs> that is like a normal right. thing to start with. And that, to me, is much healthier. That kind of thinking is healthier than mm. I'm going to have the perfect relationship and I can visualize that perfect and I'm going to make it happen. Because Sometimes mm. that's great, but sometimes it just sets you up for a kind of why have you know an impossible standard. So there, there's smart. a balance, right? There's a I think there's a sub clause yeah. that goes if if everything turns out brilliantly, then yes, right. But yeah, you know, but if it doesn't, then that has that has to be okay. Yeah. There has to be a situation that's comfortable and also you know exciting. Why not you know why there's 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 why not also be happy with things Where as you they are. are. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's, it's an important bit that gets missed. Yeah, appreciating and being yeah. in gratitude and all those things. What is, um, do you have any regrets of all the work you've done or just anything in your life where you regret maybe something you did or something you didn't do or something you wish you've done? And I have no clue what you're gonna say here, but I'm just curious if you have regrets from whether your personal life, your career life. Well, I, I um, <clears throat> 
always, it's difficult, I always think of like, um, a friend said this, which I thought was great. You know, Richard Wiseman, if you come across his work, is mm -hmm. a kind of popular psychologist, he's great. So like, you know, it's like trying to pull out a, a um, like a big jar with loads of different colored threads, you know, you just, sometimes you try and pull one out, but of course it just all comes out together. So how you, how you go <laughs> back and like, remove one thread from your life. But um, so I'm I'm gay, but I didn't I didn't come out till I was like thirty. So that's like that's kind of late. Um, seventeen year seventeen years ago, right? So yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's like I do kind of think that's normally where my mind goes. Like, well, do you, really? Do you regret anything? Because that's like a really long time. But I don't think I'd put half the energy into sort of doing the stuff that I do if I didn't if I wasn't a desperately trying to avoid any conversations about sex and just like basic, you know, human conversation. So that like, you, you tend to get very good at like deflecting uh, attention mm -hmm, with, mm -hmm. you know, dazzling, amazing yeah, things, right? Tricks. That's like a yeah. good strategy if you're trying to avoid that kind of subject. So, you know, weirdly that kind of helped. Um, huh. And so I don't know. You so you know, can so justify these things as well. You're like, well, I wish I would have came out earlier, but at the same time. Yeah, and you know what it really, what it, what it really did, and I think would, gay or straight or whatever, there, we, we often have things about ourselves that would be good to come out about, right? Stuff that we just carry a lot of shame around about. And, oh God, I could never tell people. And what's fascinating and why the coming out thing, regardless of what it's about, not necessarily about sexuality, just anything, if it's something to come out about, and this is what I found, it's liberating not because you get to go, oh, I'm gay or I'm whatever, is that you realize, like, no one gives a fuck. No, yeah. no one cares. And Maybe we, we, two or three people or something. Yeah, but they don't. Yeah, but that's it. We would. The, the, <clears throat> what really settled into my head was this idea that we'd worry a lot less about what other people think of us if we realise how seldom they do. Right? Wow. They really don't really care. So once you've done that with your big thing that you've carried all this shame around for, then you realise, oh, oh, yeah, everything's fine. Wow. So because of that, I, other than. I was probably a bit of a dick for a long time while really? I was like struggling with all that stuff, but that's I kind of you know you got to forgive yourself that. You can't so, be peace with it, yeah. Yeah, so I don't I don't know I don't have any regrets. It's yeah. actually kind of it's fine. I'd like to be you know I, I kind of I'd like to be a better partner and a better person and a better you know, those those mm. are things that I think are you know good to engage with in, right, in right. the present. Yeah. Is there anything you're struggling with right now? Is it like or what is the biggest challenge for you? Because you don't have anxiety. You're oh, and I hate, look, I have anxiety. I'm just, don't, don't think do. I don't. I just mean my, my, I'm, I get so good at natural. Avoiding it. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't have anxiety like some people have anxiety, but I, there are, like, there are different patterns, aren't there? So you've got classically anxiety pattern and avoidance pattern. So like if there's a stressor, if there's a challenge, if there's something in your life that comes up that's stressy, do you run towards it like a magnet and try and fix it, like some people do, it's what my partner does, it's like, <laughs> absolutely, like, that makes it worse, I think. Yeah. Um, but are you drawn to, are you drawn to stress, yeah, yeah. or do you just naturally avoid it? I'm very good at avoiding it, but that isn't, both sides have their ups and downs, right? I like, I, but we, then it kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of nice, we work well with each other, because we, he makes Come me a little more engaged in things, and I, you know, help him calm down a yeah. bit about other stuff. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I'm kind of, what I find interesting in, at the moment is the tension between the urge. It was kind of like what you were saying about the the is that Nietzsche. You know, Nietzsche. He kind of had this mm -hmm. line of "become who you are." That was his. Mm -hmm. That was his drive, right? So there's there's that one idea of that there is a a version of you that's out there somewhere that you want to clear everyone out of the way so you can just you know focus on that. Uh, and I think as you, you know, if you get married or you've got kids and stuff, that, that kind of tension, that sense of like <clears throat> can be very strong. And then there's the other completely conflicting impulse, which is, well, maybe the best version of myself, rather than being out there somewhere, which I'm never going to reach, right, mm -hmm. is <clears throat> actually right here. here. It, maybe the self is something that extends and is sort of active and fluid and extends out into the relationships and, that you're in now. But, you know, both are important. What's, what's hard is... And I think this, you know, is just generally in, you know, in life is is hard. Is, is. The, uh, like you know, conflicts, ambivalence is important and again real. It's part of life that things conflict and things are ambiguous and things are you know messy and and that that's okay. And actually, it, it's okay to let completely conflicting, opposing ideas 
satellite. I mean, look, right, it was, right. I mean, look, politically, you know, we're, we're so like this now that we each think the other side is just, is just like <laughs> mad and evil. And we've kind of forgotten that, which is kind of what sacrifice uh, is about. Oh, is yeah. We've forgotten that actually the dialogue between the sides Forgetting the personalities involved, but the dialogue between the sides is actually where, where you find humanity and where truth is ultimately going to be found, right? You've, you've got two very different narratives about, you know, the conservative urge is essentially about protecting the group, right? It's about mm -hmm. holding <coughs> things together, hierarchies, yeah. holding that together, but it can happen at the expense of the weaker individuals. And then the left-wing narrative is about protecting the weaker individuals and, and it doesn't tearing down yeah and yeah, letting yeah. it doesn't if that can happen at the expense of the overall yeah. structure that's you know that's fine so but you know sometimes we think as sometimes we do have to think as a group and sometimes we have to think as individuals and we've we've evolved like along both lines yeah. and both sides ultimately are gonna are gonna be important so you know dialogue is important and likewise in life things are messy and they're complex mm -hmm. and they're ambiguous and there is a you know growing up is Tolerating ambiguity, I think. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what is your greatest fear? Uh, or the, fears? You're going to forget about my hand and give me a really hard handshake at the end of this. <laughs> uh, I don't like spiders. Um, <laughs> I don't. Um, greatest fear? I don't know. Uh, I think. Uh, I think kind of, you know. I think getting it all wrong. You know, maybe letting, I hate the idea of like letting, letting my partner down, mm. like, you know, just sort of letting things and people down, letting myself down. I kind of, re I really, I really think about these things and try and get them right and I try and communicate them through the work that I do and, and uh, you can only ever be good enough, right? Again, it's not about ever being... You can Perfect. give your best, yeah. yeah you, can, you, you can't can just, control how people respond or react. Exactly, to exactly. the way you show up, right? Yeah. So it's not a kind of anxiety fear, but in terms of the things that I think about that, uh, you know, I, I, part of me, as I said, wants like, everyone clear out the way and I just want to pursue these things, but then what am I going to be? I think, I, I think I'd become this great, fascinating version of myself. I'd probably just become some weird old man. You know, we, we cross state, don't we? We develop like a sort of a hard shell when we're on our own for too long. And what relationships do is they make you more conscious mm. of all the things that are just mad about you. Because otherwise you're unconscious of them. And it's the things you're unconscious of that will own you and will come back and bite you. So relationships are so important. But because I'm naturally kind of a bit of a loner, it's like, like I'm mm. really aware at the moment of that tension. That, that for me, in the kind of middle bit of life, that's kind of that's what I find really interesting in the moment. Wow. Since you are, you do like to be alone, it sounds like, and be kind of in your art and your crafts and your photography, like isolated in some mm. sense of the word. But I'm hearing you say that you, when you are around people or your partner, you don't want to let those people down. Is that what I'm hearing you say? I, it's, well, yeah, because that's a potential for sort of, right. not only letting other people down, but just becoming this intolerable, horrible version of myself. <laughs> gotcha. so it's, it's, that, it's just gotcha. trying to get that stuff, you know, trying to get that yeah. stuff right. Are you like how old are you? Sorry, thirty-five. Thirty-five. Okay, yeah. so you've probably got a while before those sort of things <laughs> start to become uh, start to become pressing. Well, I think uh, you know I've, I've been talking a lot about this in, in uh, just in my work that, and through all the people that I've interviewed over the years of different backgrounds and stuff, there's really three main fears that I've found that ah, most okay. of us have. Yeah. Uh, the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. We don't go after something or pursue something or. Mm speak or do music or whatever it may be because we don't want to fail yeah. that, that fear of like oh, I'm a failure I'm a loser right yeah. the fear of success where then we're leaving our pack our community because if mm. we're succeeding and they're not coming with us then I'm alone and they're not mm. going to accept me or the pressure that I have to perform again mm. I have to repeat mm. the success yeah. right yeah. you might have felt that when you had this hit show and it's like it's got to be better it's got to be better right and then the third one spiders Spiders, yes. Yeah. Spiders and snakes and heights. Yeah. Uh, the fear of judgment. Of, oh, yeah. Of yeah. either way, or, you know, making sure that people like us, uh, you know, fear of like, well, you're the one. If I succeed or fail, are people going to like me? And for me, the judgment is always, was always the fear until I addressed it about five years ago. 
because as an athlete, I was taught that you had to fail to succeed. Mm. And I was the youngest of four. I was the, the, I was this tall when I was like 11 and just like goofy and gangly. I wasn't like this stud athlete or whatever. <laughs> I was the one that everyone made fun of. I had a, uh, you know, I was in special needs classes. So it was hard for me to read and write all through college. Almost flunked English in high school, all those things. So I had a lot of insecurities about the perception people had about me. Right. Like my image, my yeah, ego. Like, yeah. what do they think about me? What do they say about me? Am I sh am I saying the right things? Like, I always yeah. thought I was off. So that judgment was a, what drove me to be a great athlete, to succeed, to achieve, to perform well, and to win at everything. Mm. So it was like accomplishment driven. And <clears throat> I realized that failure wasn't a fear for me because coaches taught me you've got to practice. You're going to miss shots. That's how you learn. Mm. So I was like, all right, I'm going to fail every day, and it's mm. okay. That's mm. the foundation for achievement. And that's all I wanted was the success. Mm. But it was like, did I slip? Did I look silly? Did it, you know, the fear of like yeah, what people think about yeah, me. Yeah. And so you're still <clears> living <throat> that out though. That's what's interesting, isn't what's it? What's that? You're still living that out, that same fear of judgment. You're still living it out, but you've, you've turned it into something. I'm aware of it. I'm yeah. very aware of it. I, well, I started to accept it. And, and five years ago, I, I opened up about being sexually abused as a kid. And I've talked about it many times on this show and you know, wrote a book about uh, all that stuff. And it wasn't until I fully opened up about all my fears and insecurities about that and many other things. Mm. It wasn't until I like opened up about it and my fear was like, everyone's gonna judge me. Everyone's mm. gonna, no one's gonna love me. No one's mm. gonna accept me. Like, mm. they're just gonna make fun of me even more. Yeah. And I had everything to lose, right? Mm. I, I had a successful business and career and everything, but I was like, no one can know about this stuff. Like, mm. no one can know that you're gay, whatever. Mm. Maybe that was a feeling, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, totally. And for me, it was like the most shameful thing that I held on to for 25 years, yeah. or until I was 30. And um, but when it happened, I was like, man, this weight, like no one, no one cares. No one cares, yeah. And in fact, they cared more about me. At that moment, they were like, well, I respect you more. I trust you yeah. more, because I felt like something was, your ego was in the way. And when people are like that, when people have that thing that like people when they're closeted, for example, uh -huh. whatever it is, there's always a bubble around them. Like I, I knew I had it around me and I have friends that have kind of come out since. And there's just a bubble and you just can't quite get to them because they're, because they're something constantly missing, right? Yeah, yeah constantly, something. Yeah. And that was, that was and me. And you were probably doing the same as, as was I. And then, so people only, people only go, ah, and they step in closer. It's, a nice, it's only it. a good experience. And all of a sudden, people. everyone was telling me vulnerable things about them that yeah. I never knew. And I was like, wow, well, we can connect on a deeper yeah. level. Yeah. And it's a whole, it's an amazing thing to kind of discover, isn't it? It's such yeah, a simple thing for everybody else. But it's an amazing thing to discover. But once I kind of let go of, listen, I still have an ego and like, you know, I want to, you know, perform well and all these things. I want to do a good job and, mm. and, and do all that stuff. But it's like, I care so much less about the way I look and the way people are judging me. Because I'm like, they're gonna judge me whether I'm doing nothing or doing something. Mm. Either way, the people are gonna judge me for a moment and then they're gonna let go and judge someone else, like whatever. Mm. Mm. And so I think I've come to the point where I've accepted mm. myself. Mm. And, because I used to not think I was enough. And that's why I was like constantly living in one of these fears. Yeah. So, yeah. and I think once we can start to just accept who we are, as opposed to saying, well, I'm not the perfect version of myself like you were talking about. Let me be where I'm at right now and appreciate the moment. And I, th you know, I think the most we can hope for often is just being conscious of these things. Like yeah. There is, there is a, we can't always. It's you know, it's not easy just to go, oh great, and then change anything. But being conscious means that it yes. owns you less. So like we, yeah. from the from the word go, we are we come into this world, and we are given powerful messages from our you know parents, our caregivers, our authority figures, mm -hmm. kind of going. Here is the relationship between you and the world. You are, you are small, the world is big. You have no power, the world has power. And we learn very quickly what, what that is. What, what are, it's a skewed vision. Mm. We have, you know, Jung talks about the greatest burden the child has to bear is the unlived life of its parents. How great, how great is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's like right on us from the word go. Putting the pressure, yeah, yeah. But we are adapting creatures, right? The thing that makes us so great at evolution, because we adapt, really starts to kind of fuck us up a bit with, with, with this sort of life thing because we, we adapt to that, we internalize it, and we go, oh, okay, so I'll, I'll think of myself like this, and I'll think of the world like this. And we start to kind of live that out. We develop a template of what love means from our parents, which is entirely realistic, uh, unrealistic, because mm -hmm. we see all the nice stuff, like they presumably, hopefully, please, God, give us the best side 
of themselves. But we don't see the arguments they have when they're, you know, we know what it's like now as adults, yeah, what, yeah. what the experience of parenting is like. We don't see them screaming and arguing and I losing saw sleep. That. Maybe, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I saw yeah maybe you did. Yeah, yeah. Um, but very often at least, so there's a, there's a sure. idea of like this uh -huh. template of what love is that isn't, isn't really like realistic. And we start to bring that into our, that becomes our template for our adult our relationships because that's yeah. all we know, right? And then we're projecting all of that stuff onto our And onto expecting our certain things, yeah. And we live out these same patterns. Everything comes back again and again because we, we just, the stuff we're not conscious of is the stuff that, that, that rules us. And if we bury, you know, we, we bury one part of us, like, like if you're, you know, if you're the, the, the homophobic, I don't know, the homophobic televangelist who, uh, you know, preaches against all that and then gets, you know, caught in bed with some right, guy and there's like right. a big scandal. It'll come back and bite you if, you if you bury these things, you know. So the most we can do, I think, is become conscious of how we adapt in these ways to skewed messages, mm. skewed, you know, our, our compasses are all over the place. We internalize it, we think that's the truth, and then we go through life kind of looking for things that in a familiar way repeat that pattern. Mm -hmm. So people can have the same problems with relationships again and again. Because that's what they know. Because that's what they that's know. That's what it's supposed to be is true. How do you think, no matter where we're at in our lives, how do we rewire and master our mind? How can we say, You're you know asking what? me like I know. Bear in mind, look, the only reason why I have any language for this stuff is it, because, study is this it stuff. doesn't come naturally. Like, if it came right. naturally, if it was all sec, I wouldn't have the language for but it. That's why you're an mean. expert, because you've studied this, and it, with all the experiments you've done and all the people you've worked with, just by observing people, how do you think... I feel like you've had thousands of interactions with people where you've been able to set things up for them, tell a story or not tell a story to have them go in a certain direction. So how do we rewire our minds to at least be aware of what we want, what we don't not want, and how do we become more of a master over our minds as opposed to it being a master of us? I think we set our goals realistically. We allow for failure to be comfortable. Mm. We align ourselves with that X equals Y line and not try and crank everything up here because if we're trying to do that we're just buying into someone's system somewhere and we're just make we're going to make life miserable for us eventually and we're going to blame ourselves when that happens what do you um, mean failure comfortable meaning be okay with failure yeah to let to let i mean even is it even failure i mean i don't know it's just the it's difference learning. it's just experiences isn't it's it so learning, just, yeah. yeah how you make <clears throat> that make your peace with the fact that life isn't going to always produce what you'd like it to and make make that okay um that's huge and as i said become the best we can do is become more conscious of these things now that so that can happen through psychotherapy right a psychotherapist is going to hopefully um i'm like depth psycho like psychoanalysis yeah. that kind of thing increases your uh your sort of dialogue with yourself increases increases your consciousness about those things but it's very expensive and it's long form yeah, and a course. lot of people aren't yeah, yeah. interested but that's one way of doing it Another way, I guess, is to is to look honestly at your life and see, well, where are these where are these recurring patterns? What mm. am I, what keeps cropping up? What am I a bit obsessed by? What am I constantly trying to avoid? What am I? Uh, what just keeps coming back and biting me? What does life keep keep throwing at me? That's that's like that's bad and causing problems. And then we just tr trace that back, see where it goes back to. And are there any other? possibilities of any other ways of behaving and it's not like it just goes great and then you change but you become more conscious of it and then it's like a little drip by drip mm -hmm. feeding into the soul that yeah. you know can, can make a difference I think I think you know I think these are sort of modest sure sure modest sure. goals yeah of course important. I'm curious who is um, more influential in your 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 youth your mm -hmm. mom or your dad to you more well you. Uh, both my dad may be kind of in a sort of negative sense. I mean, we, there was not like any bad blood, but this is quite common, I think, with like mm -hmm. boys that are gay growing up, is that you tend to have the stronger bond with the mother and the father's sort of, it's just kind of a bit of a disconnect there. So, um, but of course, both end up being hugely influential because both of those impulses um, inform who you are as, right. as an adult. And people ask, well, what are the easiest and most important habits to start building? Going back to the basics, making your bed, drinking water. This first thing I do is I drink a tall glass of water. 
Most people drink coffee right away or tea. Tall glass of water. The brain needs to get activated 